And I want to welcome you to our event uh, this morning, Successful Pathways to Education, Health, and Well-Being, uh, touching on how community centers like uh, Mary's Center uh, improve the health, but also the social and economic well-being of households and communities. You're going to hear this morning uh, initial findings uh, evaluating this quite remarkable organization, uh, and a, an evaluation that combines a wide range, uh, an organization that combines a wide range of services uh, and strategies to help improve uh, the health and economic condition of families. Uh, I want to begin with a, a special thanks to the Urban Institute, uh, both for the valuable mixed methods uh, evaluation that they conducted for, um, for Mary's Center, and also for providing this space uh, for our meeting here today. I also want to thank the staff of uh, NIH who contributed uh, their time to the other evaluation you'll be uh, hearing about today uh, on uh, Mary's Center. Uh, at Mary's Center, we're celebrating, actually today, uh, our uh, 30th anniversary. Uh, and I want to thank all the loyal supporters of, of Mary's Center, both those who uh, contributed to this evaluation, uh, support to this evaluation. I just, hesit uh, I just want to emphasize that they played no part in the research itself, but I want to thank them. And I also want to thank all the people who've contributed over the years uh, to making it possible for Mary's Center to deliver uh, the kinds of services that you'll hear about uh, to people uh, without regard to their income. Uh, and indeed, uh, supporters of Mary's Center since 2012 have contributed $34 million uh, to provide free or, or subsidized uh, assistance and, and health care to people. So it's a really tremendous organization, and you can see why I'm thrilled to be uh, a part of it. Uh, just some technical points about uh, this morning. First of all, the, this session is being webcast, and it'll be available through the event itself and also uh, afterwards. Uh, if you're watching online, you can actually submit uh, questions to uh, any of the panels uh, by uh, going to events at urban.org, and uh, that will go to the discussion uh, leaders. And for the millennials uh, uh, in the audience, uh, please uh, share your comments as we go along, as I'm told that you do. Uh, and uh, the uh, Twitter hashtag is in your, uh, is in your folder. Uh, so without further ado, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce a, a good friend uh, and a good friend of all the work that we're doing uh, to dedicate, uh, uh, dedicating uh, her time to uh, providing the research and support and policy for the kind of work that we're doing at Mary's Center and that others are doing in this field. Uh, the Urban Institute's president, uh, Sarah Wartell. Good morning, everyone. Great, you can tell, good audience. They, they know what their assigned role is. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, thank you, Stuart, and I'm looking for Maria. There she is, okay. Uh, and uh, uh, I wanna say congratulations to Maria and congratulations to everyone involved in Maria Center. Uh, I'm in Maria's, in Mary's Center. Uh, it is Mar Maria's Center, but it's, it's all of your center. Um, uh, for, I mean, a, a really th uh, extraordinary 30-year record of work. This is a really major milestone anniversary. I should say, uh, you know, I don't need to say how lucky you are to have the extraordinary dynamic uh, CEO leading uh, the work. And uh, the, uh, Stuart Butler recently became your board chair, and that is also, he's a great colleague and collaborator with us at the Urban Institute on many issues. And uh, you could not uh, have a better and more thoughtful uh, leader for your board. So uh, it, it, well poised to move into its second 30 years. Congratulations to everyone at Mary Center. Um, here at the Urban Institute, we are very proud and honored to have been chosen to be your partner in this work and also to be able to welcome you here to the Urban Institute to host your symposium today. Um, and so thank you also to everyone else who chose to join us for this conversation. Community health centers play a central role in maintaining healthy and thriving communities. Um, Urban, we're very pleased to have been working with Mary Center to help measure the impact uh, on communities and on residents of their work. Examining how they and other community health centers play a role in the lives of under-resourced people and places by delivering the much needed healthcare services uh, uh, into, those, uh, into those communities and to support the social and economic well-being 
of the area's residents. In collaboration with Mary Center, as Stuart has described, we are conducting a mixed method study of the Center's social change model to better understand what it takes to effectively implement sophisticated social determinants of health interventions. We expect that policymakers and practitioners will learn a lot from what Mary Center's model, about Mary Center's model generally and um, uh, from the evaluation about what it, what it accomplishes when you provide high quality, multilingual, culturally competent care that makes an impact in underserved people and families' lives. The urban work is still in progress that you're going to hear and it includes extensive data collection to document uh, the perspectives of the diverse staff, clients, and community who are served by Mary Center's model. We'll be doing, we have been doing survey data collection from over 300 of Mary Center staff and interviews and focus groups with clients, partners, and community stakeholders. I want to give major props to Mary Center for opening themselves up to the critical eye of the NIH and Urban Institute scholars uh, who are looking at their work. It's hard to do that. It's really hard when you're doing the work every day to have somebody come and say, this is great, but maybe you could do it a little bit better, or this isn't working as much as you think it is. That's hard to ask. Uh, and it takes time, too. And so another really important props is to all of the Mary Center staff who are taking time to be part of these conversations and to help us understand the organization so that we're in a position to gain the right access about it. So congratulations uh, to everyone for uh, what is really a kind of bold and leadership move. Um, here at Urban, we're very proud of all of our work supporting the organizations in the greater D.C. area through our Urban Greater D.C. initiative led by Gustavo Velasquez, and I saw there, Gustavo, I saw, there he is in the back, um, uh, where we try to work uh, and build and share knowledge to help the region and all of its people thrive. A couple just quick examples of the kind of things we do. Uh, recently worked with the Coalition for Nonprofit Housing and Economic Development in the D.C. Department of Housing and Community Development and Code for D.C. to together to create a cool website, I encourage you to go, called Housing Insights, which is an open source tool that uses data and technology to help government and community development staff make better choices about which investments to make in the D.C. area's affordable housing. When public school officials in the D.C. region were trying to decide uh, about uh, closing schools and feeder patterns, those were their choices, but the analysis that they used came from work that we at the Urban Institute were able to give them to help them make evidence-based decisions. And recently we developed a model bullying prevention policy for youth serving agencies in the city in partnership with 42 members of the Mayor's Bullying Prevention Task Force and the Office of Human Rights. So we love to be a partner with change makers, we say. Change makers who are the people who are leading change throughout this city, uh, bringing them the power of knowledge, as we like to say, uh, to make uh, better choices, um, change makers like Mary Center uh, and others. Urban is having an anniversary too, uh, and in fact, next year we'll be celebrating in our new home and we'll welcome you all back into our much larger natural daylight uh, enabled <laughs> <laughs> facility. I cannot wait. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, in that new space, we'll celebrate not just a look back at our last 50 years, but just like Mary Center is doing today, looking at our next 50. What, are the, what is the work that we can do that will be important to help the D.C. region and the rest of the country? Asking questions like, what would it take to ensure that all of us have access to an affordable home in a community rich with opportunity? What would it take to eliminate policies, practices, and institutional structures that impede racial equity? What would it take to achieve healthy, active communities with access to all of the necessary health resources that, and non-health resources that help to create healthy lives? Um, there are great forces of change that are affecting our society, and in many ways we worry that they could harden inequalities, that they could make it more challenging for us uh, to, and further divide us as a people. But we're trying to think hard about how do we harness those forces of change and put them in service of building a world in which everyone has a chance to contribute, to work, to be valued, to belong, to have voice, and ultimately to thrive. And that's the shared journey that we think we're on with Mary Center. So my last uh, great opportunity is to introduce our keynote speaker this evening, Raphael, this evening, this morning. <laughs> it was a very late night for me. It feels like evening. Uh, 
to welcome Rafael Lopez, who is going to give us our keynote address. He is the managing director of Accenture's health and public service practice. In his work, he leverages technology and innovation to help shape national strategies for a variety of health and human service agencies all throughout North America. But prior to his work in Accenture, he has too long for me to list uh, a resume, but I think you all have in your bios, uh, of all kinds of work in both the public and private sector, working to improve the lives of children, youth, and families. He served as the commissioner of the Administration for Children, Youth, and Families at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, which I always call ACF, and I realize there's a Y in there somewhere, so I've got a problem, and served as a senior technology policy advisor at the White House uh, and worked on the Domestic Policy Council. So a uh, great perspective to help launch us today. Please join me in welcoming Rafael. Good morning, everyone. Buenos dias. So I feel like I have to say feliz cumpleaños, happy birthday, right? <laughs> you look extraordinary for 30. Uh, seriously. Um, uh, uh, it's like, where's the cake, right? <laughs> Although there's a party tonight. So um, thank you so much for the introduction and um, to Maria and the team at Mary Center for inviting me here today. It was such an easy yes to make um, because of the extraordinary legacy that you have built upon here. So uh, Maria, of course, asked me to solve world hunger in under 20 minutes, uh, not jo sort of joking, uh, but I will try to sort of frame up a variety of themes, um, not just in reflecting on our 30 years here and in terms of what we're celebrating and reflecting on the data and sort of really bringing to bear um, the results of really extraordinary work, but really about talking about the future as well and that this is a new beginning. So the first 30 years is really the first chapter in this work. And now with the kind of data that NIH and Urban Institute are helping us better understand what does that help inform for the next 30 years, not just in terms of evidence-based practices and developing a model that is centered on communities of color, but also lifting up the extraordinary work of the team who do that day in and day out. And so I'd like to take a moment here, not just to celebrate the extraordinary leadership of Maria, but the countless people and unsung heroes and faces we never see. Right? The janitors who clean out the clinics, the people and the practitioners who draw the blood, the people who are cleaning the teeth and helping make sure that every single one of our children, youth, and families are doing well. To all of the team at Mary Center, thank you for your service, not just to Mary Center, but to the country. So one of the things that I had the privilege of doing over the last couple of weeks was receiving lots of information from Mary Center, which I asked for. Um, data on who, who, what are the demographics, who are they, unduplicated count, sort of drilling down into the data, not just in the context of the Urban Institute NIH work, but really trying to get a, a handle on what's the story here. And of course, there are multiple stories here. Um, you're going to hear several of them told today through a series of panels, but I want to give sort of my perspective uh, on how I take a look at this, having both worked in the public sector for most of my career in nonprofit organizations and city, county, and state, and federal government, and also in the private sector, and sort of give to you sort of three central themes that I've been able to glean from the extraordinary work that Mary Center has done. First off, it's important to note just how important Mary Center has um, played a role, not just in the DMV region, but really in setting um, a pace for the country. And, and really how Mary Center is an exemplar of a mission-driven organization that is creating extraordinary value every single day and delivering on results. That's not easy to do. They've also been able to create an extraordinary ecosystem of their own within a very complicated and complex healthcare environment and are relentless in the pursuit of excellence and delivering results for the people they serve. Um, one of the things that um, one thinks about when you think about Mary Center is its role in the federally qualified health center movement and FQHC, not just in terms of the compliance issues when one is complying with HRSA, that's in some ways the floor, right? The ceiling is the issues to which Mary Center aspires and is helping us think about. That's about the horizon and the future, right? A future that began in a basement a basement 30 years ago. And when you think about that, you think about how that dramatically informed their social change model. The notion that the three pillars of comprehensive health care, of education and social support could uplift in and invest the people who so proudly need not a handout, but help to thrive with their families. 
And when you think about that, the exponential growth over the last 30 years has moved from that basement in Washington, D.C. Um, to five centers across the DMV area, from serving a few hundred clients a year to over 50,000 clients in 2018 alone. And looking at the change of the way in which those services have been offered, first predominantly for a Latino community, and still that remains, but we're already seeing, just by walking in the clinics, a change in the demographics of those that Mary Center is serving. And what's important to that change is ultimately that at the core of everything was that the staff and the team understand deeply that the people who come to the door for assistance are worthy in and of themselves that they don't look at the people as a burden, but in fact full of hope and full of promise, and ultimately understand what it means to be a bicultural staff, a multicultural staff, uh, uh, to bring cultural competence into the practice day to day, and to use trauma-informed services and care in the provision of services, whether you're in the after-school programs or you're receiving prenatal care. Ultimately, I thought to myself, that basement story, right, moving from the basement to five centers, is very similar to what you often hear and raved about worldwide with things like Hewlett Packard or Apple, right? You hear the story of Silicon Valley, and, you, and I've actually been to the home of, of David Packard, um, who launched the Packard Foundation in California, where I'm from originally, and you look out onto the Silicon Valley, that was filled with orchards, prunes and bell peppers and sort of agricultural fields. Now it is Silicon Valley. But we herald the story of inventing the computer in the garage. Wouldn't it be extraordinary if we heralded the Mary Center starting in the basement in the same way in which we lift up the innovation that we see at Packard or at Apple or at Amazon in Seattle? Those kinds of stories and narratives come from the people that we serve. And we have to be able to model that kind of innovation in a different way. It doesn't just come from technology. It doesn't just come from entrepreneurs. It comes from the heart and souls of basements like the one where Mary Center started. The role of community health centers, as exemplified by, by Mary Center, play an extraordinary role in helping people in, multiple, um, in solving multiple challenges they face day to day. And that social change model, really, when I took a look at it, it, it struck me that it was the intersection of the three pillars, that it looked at the way in which those things interacted, comprehensive health, education, social support, that it was in that nexus where sort of the secret sauce was, right? And really taking a look at how do we prove that over time so that we have the right data and the evidence to document over time that in fact there are many markers that are changing. And in fact, Mary Center already plays a significant role amongst its peers, being ranked among the top FQHCs in the country for things like immunizations and making sure babies are born healthy. And one need only look at the data, not just in North America, but around the world, around the way in which states and localities are ranked for infant mortality and why it is that mothers give weight, um, birth to um, low, weight, uh, low birth weight babies. All of these things that seem so unsurmountable, I would propose to you and invite you to consider that Mary Center is helping solve them. They may be imperfect, but it is in the action and the rapid prototyping that has led to greater solutions, not just for the region, but for the country. So there are three things I'd like to invite you to consider, and I want to lift them up. And I thought to myself, in some ways, my role is to help kick off the day by getting us up on the balcony and taking a look at what's happening. And so the analogy, if I will, for a second is, you can imagine when you go to a theater or a movie theater or someplace else, you're sort of high up, sitting up in these chairs, and you sort of look down at the thing. And sometimes, when you take a step back, you can see the world or the room from a very different perspective. And it's from that perspective that I offer you three key themes. One, the notion that Mary Center is modeling, not just now, but for the future, frictionless services as a lever for social change. Two, that Mary Center is helping us all think about the movement from theory to action via rapid prototyping. And third, that Mary Center is modeling now and for the future human-centered policymaking. And I want to take a moment to go into each of those three areas as to sort of why I think that might be an interesting way to think about just, not just today, but as we move forward in the next chapter of 30 years. On the first theme, this notion of frictionless services. So how many of you have cell phones either in your hands, in your lap, or in your pockets right now? Raise your hand. Right? Okay. The majority of the room. How many of you use that phone every single day with an app to get some sort of a service? Order food, get a car, dry cleaning, order a book, order a product. Raise your hands if you do that. Most of the room, right? And if you don't do it on your phones, do, raise your hand if you do it on a laptop or some other tech device. Right, again, so almost the entire room, for those of us joining on the webcast, is lifting the room. And for those of us joining on the webcast, please use the hashtag more than health to join us in this conversation, both in tweeting your comments and in lifting up questions. Frictionless services 
ultimately, in my perspective, comes from the notion that we can get a pizza delivered and we know exactly who's making it and what toppings are being prepared and when it will come to your door. Why? Because as the father of two young boys, they love pizza. And they used to love being able to watch, oh, it is Rafael putting the pepperoni on your pizza and it's going to arrive in 17 minutes and they watch that happen. That notion, I'm not saying that Mary's Center should be in the forefront of creating an app for that, but the technology that underlies this foundation, the notion that it could be easy to order a pizza and to know exactly what's happening, whether it's pizza, ordering a book on Amazon, it's this frictionless notion that you can get what you need when you want it. And it's that issue of how do we make healthcare more frictionless when you are struggling with diabetes, or you're struggling with any of the variety of issues that Mary Center helps solve, how can they be even more frictionless in the way in which they're delivering services? How can they be a model and continue being on the cutting edge for the nation? How can the data that we're collecting and analyzing through NIH and Urban Institute help us better understand the right kinds of things to collect over time so that we can make the services more frictionless, more seamless, and have a profound impact in delivering on results for better well-being of all of their clients? Second theme, this notion of Mary Center as a model for moving from theory to action via rapid prototyping. So the term rapid prototype comes from Silicon Valley. Um, and ultimately, very much the way in which I, I talked about the notion of founding a, you know, a, a company in a garage with a computer, right? Um, the idea that we have to be thoughtful about trying and failing faster. So that if we have an idea, the creation of a computer or the creation of a cell phone, we can't wait 10 years to decide, is it a good cell phone? Is it a good computer? We have to more quickly decide, is this thing, this device, this issue using all of its potential to ultimately deliver on its promise. And now the same analogy. You can't directly translate word for word those issues to Mary Center, but think about the notion of rapid prototyping that Mary Center has already done. The three pillars came from the team and the staff testing out what is the right set of services? What is the right dosage? of the three kinds of services. How do you take a mom who's about to deliver a baby and already has a preschooler and connect them to the array of services both that Mary Center provides and the tentacular network into which Mary Center has connected across the DMV area? This notion that they have to rapidly prototype is very relevant to Mary Center model because when they know that something doesn't work, they've got to change it. Sometimes it's a tweak in the service or a tweak in the pitch to the parent about how to get them hooked. Or as I saw when I walked around the clinic a week ago, the notion that there's a space where food is shared and bread is broken at a table so that you can feel honored and valued for the food you bring from your culture, from your home. And it is through food that you open up new possibilities and opportunities and they begin to trust the staff and trust the environment so they too can bring the rest of their family and not fear retribution or fear being judged or fear that ultimately someone's going to report them. These kinds of nuances are all driven by rapid prototyping. Again, the analogies are very important and for the future of healthcare, just as relevant when we think about the notion of the emergence of precision medicine. So there's been quite a bit of writing nationally, internationally, about the notion of precision medicine. And I, I will ask and for the doctor to forgive me if I get the medical terminology incorrect, but at the end of the day, uh, precision medicine is about really specializing to better serve clients, the client, the, do the patient, uh, with better understanding what they need and when they need it. It's most often talked about in the, in the context of cancer and really to be precise about the way in which we're delivering services to cancer patients. I would invite us all to consider that the movement in precision medicine is exactly what Mary Center is modeling. How do we better serve clients at the individual level, at the family level, at the community level, and the system level to change population healthcare outcomes? At each of those levels, Mary Center has been a champion and a leader on the cutting edge of this. Is it perfect? No, it's not. Is it solved? Not yet. But Mary Center is playing a leadership role, not just for the DMV area, but for the country. On this third issue of human-centered policymaking, <clears throat> when you think about Mary's center uh, change model, uh, the three pillars, again, education, um, social support, and comprehensive health care, at the core of that work and that nexus is the way in which um, Mary Center staff believes in the people they serve. And this isn't always quantifiable, but I believe there's a, a road and a pathway to measuring this uh, more deliberately over time. 
First of all, they believe in the dignity and the power of the people they serve. When they look into the eyes of their clients, they see in them hope and courage and persistence and possibility, not a problem to be solved or simply studied. They're not trying to fit community, the very people they serve, into an abstract model, right? They are trying to make sure that the people, the clients, are at the core of their work. And that ultimately the policy, not just for Mary Center, but around Virginia or Maryland or Washington DC or the country is shaped by that experience. And public policy that's driven by that kind of experience will yield better results. It's already yielding better results for Mary Center, whether it's immunization or birth weight in babies or a variety of other factors that we're starting to see in the research and we'll hear later on in more detail. It is all also helping us understand that the stories of the people that are served are just as relevant to the data points that oftentimes are divorced from the people in the stories. And the thing that stands out to me at Mary Center and the work and the data that I've been able to look at is that it's the intersection of the stories and the data that makes Mary Center and the work they do so extraordinarily special. So I want to lift up for a moment a couple of those stories that I've heard over the course of the last month in talking with the team um, and, and invite you to consider how that matters in terms of human-centered policymaking. So I've heard the story of the mother who has come across Mary Center as she's about to give birth and may have not had any health care prior to several months into her pregnancy, but being welcomed into Mary Center and connecting her to services, basic things like food, and making sure that she's nourished, that her body is nourished and she's able to deliver a healthier baby. I've heard stories of multi-generations, and actually when I was walking through the clinic um, with Elisa the other day, uh, meeting people that had been there multiple generations that when they were teens, they were clients of Mary Center. And the way in which they were treated with respect and dignity mattered to how they were bringing their own family back to the clinic. Those kinds of moments matter because Mary Center cares about that moment. They care about the way in which they treat people with dignity and respect. There's also the stories of the clients who are making very difficult choices about things like buying food or paying a bill or being able to make payments on a variety of services, whether it's things like uh, making sure they have the right dental care for their children, or being able to um, cover the cost of an electricity bill. I lift up these examples because these aren't stories that are just specific to Mary Center. They're universal among under-resourced communities in this country. And at the core of them, trying to tackle this very difficult thing around poverty. And ultimately, what Mary Center has done is use their three pillars, not just in proving that change is possible in healthcare when delivered uh, precisely at the community level, but in fact change is possible in the, in the larger notion in a call to service around justice and, and justice for the people that are served. Cesar Chavez, um, the, the late labor and civil rights leader, um, was an extraordinary uh, leader on many fronts. And um, on a personal level, my own family came to this country from Mexico um, as migrant farm workers and cannery workers. And I am the son of, of laborers, um, of janitors, of cooks, of nannies, of landscapers, of dishwashers. Um, and I relate so immensely to the story of the clients of Mary Center. Because for a moment in time of my life, getting health care was very, very difficult. And whether it was using Medicaid or food stamps or other issues, um, it took certain people to treat me and my mother and our family with the right kind of dignity and respect to hold up a mirror to say, you are far stronger than you think you are. You have so much more potential than you think you do. And Cesar Chavez did that during the farm worker movement and for the labor movement, and I think Mary Center does that every single day. And I want to lift up to you something that Cesar Chavez said um, uh, through an interview uh, in a book um, that's uh, called Cesar Chavez, A Triumph of Spirit. And he said, quote, history will judge societies and governments and their institutions, not by how big they are or how well they serve the rich and the powerful, but how effectively they respond to the needs of the poor and the helpless, end quote. And from my perspective, this moral call to service um, is something that I think Mary Center exemplifies, not just for this region, but again amongst its peers of F FQHCs and for the country in terms of imagining a future that's much brighter around the provision of healthcare services for those who need them most. This moral call to service <clears throat> is also an environment that hasn't always valued the very people served by Mary Center and is oftentimes leaning into looking at them at greater problems or burdens than they are of actually 
architects of their own stories and their narratives. And much like my own story, a snippet that I've given you, um, you just never know who Mary Center is serving because one day those very children in whom they invest might grow up to be the president of the United States or they might grow up to be the governor or a CEO or the president of Urban Institute or the president of an organization or take over Mary Center. The point is when you invest early and often in the very people that you doubt, we all win. We all win because just like Cesar Chavez says, si se puede, yes we can. So I'm grateful to you this opportunity to have been with you this morning. I will join a panel later on. Um, I'm grateful to the work that Mary Center and the team have done to show the nation uh, that yes we can. Yes, we can deliver on health care in a very different way. Yes, we can deliver for the people who struggle every single day. And yes, we can believe in their stories because at the end of the day, that's the only thing that will change us and this country is the kind of work that day to day you do at Mary Center. So with that, thank you for your service and thank you for your time. And now it's my pleasure to introduce um, our next or bring up to the stage our next panel so they can get started. Thank you. So uh, first to Rafael uh, Gracias and thank you for grounding us in both the vision and the hope and the empowerment of Mary Center. Um, I feel much better than when I walked in this room this morning. <laughs> <laughs> and welcome to all of you, uh, including those of you who are joining us on, on the web. Um, I'm Elaine Waxman, I'm a senior fellow here at the Urban Institute, and it's my privilege to uh, host our first conversation this morning, where we get to put our, um, uh, some context and some uh, everyday examples uh, to what you've heard about in terms of the social change model. So I'm gonna briefly introduce our panelists. You have biographies, um, they're very rich, so please take time to be more acquainted with our guests, um, but I'll just briefly introduce them now. Um, this is Christy McKay. Um, she is the executive director of Bria Public uh, Charter School. Um, not a term you often hear associated with the health care center, so we'll learn more about that. Um, Joan Yingo, who is the uh, chief programs officer at Mary Center. And my colleague, uh, Martha Galvez, who is the, a senior research associate here and who has been leading for the last several months a qualitative research study um, interviewing staff and community uh, members, uh, clients, stakeholders to learn more about the social change model that you've heard uh, alluded to this morning. Um, but first, before we um, talk with Martha a little bit about her insights, I'd really like to start with you, Joan. Um, as Raphael alerted, alluded to, um, Mary Center figured this out a long time ago, but the rest of the world has recently woken up to the social determinants of health. Um, which means that what happens outside of the clinic visit is even more important than what happens uh, in your healthcare intervention. And that can be anything from food and nutrition to education and including that feeling of belonging and a sense of being a part of a community. Those are all things that we know drive health outcomes. Um, so I, what I'd like to do first, Joan, is hear a little bit from you about what that looks like at Mary Center. Um, what kinds of services have evolved that support families in their ability to fully engage in their health and well-being? Okay, well, thank you. Yes, at Mary Center, we've always recognized that to be truly healthy, you can't just focus on health or a prescription. You really have to recognize there's so many other variables that can impact someone's health. And when I first started at Mary Center, which was about 20 years ago, we, we called it the holistic approach to health care. We said, so to be truly healthy, we have to address economic concerns, if there's violence in the home, if there's nutritional challenges, uh, behavioral health concerns, and how can we really address those? When we started, we were small. 
and we had about five family support workers that were acted like case managers. We had a teen after school program that helped to support with tutoring. And we had an uh, insurance enrollment program and home visiting. All small and all limited in the scope of services and supports that could be provided. And so we learned and how we grew, we learned from first our staff. Our staff, our family support workers would come to us and say, this participant needs behavioral health care. I can't find any place with a bilingual therapist. Or I found one, but there's a waiting list very long. Or the, this insurance lapse, but I can't get them in to see anybody. What can I do about this? So we would, and the home visiting, the uh, prenatal providers would say, Joan, we need to get this person home visiting. Unfortunately, the service area that we can serve didn't reach where that participant lived. So learning from our staff and our participants what was needed, we worked to grow our programs. And over the years, we did grow our programs, specifically our behavioral health program. We grew our behavioral health program to have a co-located behavioral health program. And then what we found with that is co-located means we would refer and have to send someone there. And even with having co-location with behavioral health, we started to recognize, but wait a minute, then I, they have to go to another place. You know what, and it's hard, someone might not only, they come in for health care, they might not think they need behavioral health care. So they might not want therapy. So what's another innovation or other strategy that we could use? And then there's integrated behavioral health. So we started having an IBH, an integrated behavioral health provider within our health center. So they didn't have to go someplace else. The integrated behavioral health provider would meet with the participant, assess their needs, <coughs> see if they were ready, or, or maybe they just needed a brief intervention to address anxiety, or maybe they need, needed something more. And then they would do a warm handoff and get them within our co-located behavioral health program. However, then what we were seeing, and within our team program and other services, we were hearing back from schools and partners, we're trying to get the youth into your um, programs, into your behavioral health services, into your health, and we can't get them in. And especially with behavioral health, we thought, well, maybe we should have school-based mental health. So then we went and we worked and we partnered with some schools and we started to grow a school-based mental health program. So our adolescents our, or our children would have a behavioral health provider right there that was associated with Mary Center that could be seen where they uh, go to school and then that school-based mental health therapist could link that participant back within and communicate with the health provider. So it's another way that just um, grew, organically grew our programs and services. How, and that we, and as we grew, we were seeing our pediatricians would tell us, you know, we're having this, this child, with this child's acting out, we can't find early childhood programming, or we think it's social emotional, what can we do to grow that? So we brought in parent, an, innovation, an innovative program called Parent-Child Interactive Therapy to support the parent and child um, to support the parent in really bonding and forming that attachment with the child and an added resource for our pediatricians and for the parents so they felt strong and were able to be the parents that they wanted to be. And with home visiting, we recognized we needed to invest in citywide home visiting and continue to work not only internally, but partner with other agencies across the city that wanted to provide home visiting. And one of the key partners was Children's Health Center that provided um, pediatric care in Ward 8. We partnered with them so we could expand our home visiting services and really help to show how we can reach the city and bring our model throughout the city. And additionally, as our programs grew, it wasn't just by hearing from people, it was also by research. Uh, partnering with researchers from universities like George Washington, Georgetown University. We, they, came to, they would come to us and ask us, would you want to partner? We want to really support um, perinatal uh, depression. And we have a way to, pre to a model that might prevent depression. And so, and it would support your, the community you're serving. You could get this data and this research and see if this is something that you wanted to bring. So partnering with researchers help to strengthen our services, allow us to try different things to see what models could work for us, and then using that data to inform practice. 
So that was with, so we have that partnership. And additionally, it looked at another partnership was with our WIC program. WIC, in order to identify prenatal depression, WIC would be a great way to screen participants because they come for their children. So how is the WIC program screening for depression? And as we partnered with our George, Georgetown University and George Washington University to develop the screening mechanism, we could identify questions and systems that support us locally, but then they were able to take that nationally. Not only were we supporting our own participants accessing care and helping to identify if there is a concern or a need, we were also seeing this could be a systems change nationally. And this all happened organically <laughs> over the years. And so it was, through, it was through these innovative practices that we developed these strategies, learning from researchers, learning from implementing evidence-based programming that we could measure our outcomes, use the evaluation to inform practices. So today, we, it's not just small with family support workers, all of our sites, we know to have that family support worker as the first line that might link that participant to who comes in prenatally to the WIC program, if they have a, a, a concern with food or housing to those programs. If we see, we recently, over the past couple of years, we strengthened our maternal mental health <coughs> program. So through that, if we see a depression or anxiety, we can link them with resources internally or at other locations, so it's growing the program. And with, so an example of how this all comes together is our participant, Lydia. Lydia goes to our Georgia Avenue clinic and she was seen by our provider and they were identifying severe <coughs> asthma that would I I impact her ability to go to school and attend school regularly. The provider was also concerned that there might be some behavioral health concerns. So the provider referred Lydia, did a warm handoff to our integrated behavioral health provider. The integrated behavioral health pro provider saw that there was a lot of anxiety and past trauma. And then, then she realized that this participant attends a school in which we have school-based mental health. So she referred this participant to the school-based mental health provider. The school-based mental health provider met with her, saw some real trauma. Her mother was, the participant's mother was deceased. The participant's father's in jail in his home country. And she's here with a guardian. So they, this school-based mental health began to provide therapy and then link with our other partners. Our partner with Children's Law Center to do advocacy and legal support. And then our partner with the hospital where the child is often hospitalized for lengths of time. Continuing the part and then partnering with the insurance support that we have at Mary Center so we could transition this family to health services with children's special needs insurance to provide greater support and services given the child's concerns. They all work together and they continue to work together and do care coordination. The school-based mental health therapist works in consult with the medical provider to determine what causes these anxiety attacks and is that contributing to the asthma and, uh, and trying to align what is the best course for treatment, and then in the, in the end, the participant now gets telebehavioral health, another innovation that we brought, because she's out of school temporarily. So that's an example of how that we've grown and how they've all come together. Thank you so much. So it's great that you've um, grounded us with an example of a student, mm -hmm. because it, we sometimes hear about federally qualified health centers who have a satellite in a in a school but that's not really the relationship that Bria has with St. Mary's uh, I mean with Mary Center and um, what I'd like to know is uh, tell us a little bit about what that looks like and um, what makes it so different than the typical approach mm -hmm. um, you know I, Joan I think we're up here because we're the viejitas of Mary <laughs> Center <laughs> we're, um, we've been around a long time so it's really hard for me <laughs> to think about um, um, how you could possibly have um, a, a school or a health center or social services that are not integrated because we've been doing this so long and we really 
um, recognize the importance of those integrated services. Um, so when Mary Center started, uh, Mary Center started providing prenatal care and beautiful, healthy babies were being born. Um, and soon after that, pediatrics was included and then social services or social services and then pediatrics. But um, then these babies started growing and went into school. And the tragic part was that the, the babies were struggling. Some of these babies were really struggling in school. And so Mary Center really realized that there was another critical piece to having good outcomes for our families. And that was to ensure that we were also supporting our families and accompanying our families in navigating the educational system. And so Mary Center saw the need to, to do that, but do that in an innovative way to not only focus on the child, but the whole family, because that is really how we think at Mary Center, is, is thinking about the whole family. Um, so Bria is a family literacy or two-generation um, school. We're not only working with young children, but also with the parents. Parents come every day to school to gain the skills that they want to be able to accomplish their goals through um, taking English classes, digital literacy classes, parenting classes, and then if they want to continue on, they complete their high school diploma, go on to our certificate programs like our medical assistant program and our child development um, assistant, uh, a child development associate program, which is um, the program where you can learn how to be a teacher. And um, all those skills are being taught down the hall from where children are also gaining all the skills that they will need to be able to be successful in school. And we've really seen that this model works. Um, we are fortunate to have be able to be able to provide these services through a charter school. So we are a charter school in Washington, D.C., a unique model. Um, we started with um, under 100 families and now we're a school serving over 800 students every year. Um, and we have some of the best outcomes in adult education at, um, at the city level and the national level and also in pre-K. And we attribute this to the social change model. We just would not be able to have these outcomes if it wasn't that we weren't working together, right? This model here really shows it. That's great. Maybe you could just give us an example of one um, okay. student or parent. Of course. Because that's in particular an amazing innovation of, of how they've engaged with you. And then we'll turn to Martha and let her tell us a little bit about what she's heard broadly from the community. I only get to do one. Okay, <laughs> no, um, so uh, let's see. I, um, Berta, Berta started at Mary Center with prenatal care and um, 23 years ago. And in one of her visits at Mary Center, um, she met with a caseworker who suggested that she take English classes. So after she gave birth to her baby, um, she started coming to English classes with her daughter and her daughter was in our early childhood program. And after coming to the classes for a time, she was able to gain the self-confidence to realize that she really needed to leave the violent home that she was in. And she made that difficult um, step of leaving that home with her children. Um, she went on to complete her high school diploma and went on to college. Um, and 23, 24 years later, she is a homeowner. She is an IT manager. She, has, she supervises a team of five, um, five people on her team and um, really symbolizes the work that um, Mary Center has been doing for so many years. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So this is very much a model about accompanying wherever people's um, journeys are taking them and helping them meet those challenges and, and, and move forward. So Martha, you've been able to do a lot of interviews and focus groups with clients and staff, and um, would love to hear a little bit from you about um, how the social change model um, plays out and how people um, experience that. Um, sure. 
Thanks, Elaine. And I'm the researcher, so I have slides. <laughs> we expect I apologize no less. for my slides, but here they are. And also, um, Raphael stole my talk. Um, <laughs> I will do, and now I understand why I was only given 10 minutes. <laughs> so I'm going to try to walk through some of very similar things um, and maybe keep it to five. So um, I am part of a team of Urban Institute researchers, and some of them are here in the audience, and maybe they can raise their hands, scattered throughout, yes. who've been working for the past nine or 10 months very closely with Mary Center on what I think of as kind of a 360 assessment of the social change model. Um, so trying to understand from a bunch of different perspectives how the model works in practical terms and its evolution over time with an eye towards pulling out some lessons uh, for the field, um, but also for Mary Center as they go into this next 30 years. Um, so as Sarah uh, mentioned, we've done about 50 interviews with clients and stakeholders who've worked with Mary Center in various ways uh, and with staff. We've surveyed about 300 different Mary Center staff. So in total, about half of uh, all the staff at Mary Center have communicated with us in some, in some way or another, uh, very patiently. Um, so thinking about um, kind of big picture, uh, we're really interested in what sets Mary Center apart. Um, and you know, I think I've learned that having a social determinants of health lens is not necessarily in and of itself unique for community health centers, for federally qualified health centers. Um, but we've heard kind of two things and heard from Christy and Joan, two things um, that really set Mary Center apart. One being this emphasis on education in a really unique and rigorous way and longstanding partnership. And another is, and um, we've heard this from stakeholders and from staff, this evolution from the basement to today that really has come with a, a very high level of organizational and clinical capacity uh, to allow Mary Center to do things on a large scale, to do things that are innovative, to test new things in a way that, um, that is, is novel uh, in DC and, and potentially elsewhere. Um, and then also infused through this, and it's difficult to find the right place to put it because it, it's really everywhere, is this kind of laser focus on the core mission of serving underserved, uh, primarily but not exclusively Latino immigrants in the DC area. So um, with that in mind, we're trying to really understand what are the components of Mary Center that support that growth, that have made that kind of uh, clinical capacity and the successful growth um, and pushing the social change model forward possible. And we've heard from a lot of different people and there's a lot of overlap by how we could think about this, but uh, three kind of buckets of things um, are coming to the surface. One being the organizational culture, and we'll hear a lot about that today. A sec the second being the service mix, this you know, wide array of services that folks are providing to clients. And a third being the way those services are provided. What makes, uh, I forget what Rafael said, whatever's between the pillars, if it's grease or cement or whatever the right <laughs> analogy is. Special sauce, <laughs> special sauce um, between the pillars. Um, so starting with organizational culture and kind of three things really come to mind. The first, and we're hearing this a little bit from, from both Joan and Christy, is this constant kind of push forward, uh, this uh, real openness to change as an organization and an openness to trying new things, not being afraid of being at the front end of things to be the first to, to give something a shot and to, to really um, push organizational change. Um, and that's challenging a challenging environment both to work in and to lead, I would imagine. Um, so, you know, through that, there's a, a real, um, we heard a lot about the strength of the organizational leadership from Maria, from her senior, senior staff, that to kind of push this, this general vibe of, you know, change is what is, is welcome. Um, and looking internally to try to uh, change back office process kind of stuff, but also externally to what's the next set of services. And part of that too, again, is um, creating an environment that's supportive to staff that is on board with this mission of culturally competent, multilingual, multicultural uh, care. So I won't go into the service mix because others will do that better. I will talk a little bit about the service delivery model. 
um, and I think others will touch on this, and Joan has talked about it a little bit, but in order to make a social determinants of health model work or the social change model work, it requires that folks from different parts of the organization, different types of providers, effectively communicate and collaborate with each other. It doesn't work if people don't know who to call, where to refer, what the array of services are. So what are those things that make that happen? So we've spent a lot of time trying to pick that apart, whether in our survey work, thinking about what literally is the list of things that we can ask people how often do they use. And there, you know, we came up with a long list and found that everybody uses different things at different times. A couple of things rose to the top. But um, there, there's kind of a, a, a set of tools that have been developed to help staff collaborate with each other. The um, interprofessional teams uh, we heard a lot about. Um, and uh, kind of the mechanisms that are in place to, to support coordinated care. Again, this is something that takes constant nurturing um, and isn't 100% uh, there all the time, that it's this constant effort to make sure staff know who each other are and how to communicate with each other and what the tools are in order to make this, these connections to get clients from service to service work. Um, but there is a constant attention to trying to do that. Excuse me. Um, so from there, uh, I think it's, it's useful to talk a little bit about what we're hearing from clients, because uh, the point of all this is to be able to have a positive impact on clients' lives. Uh, and this is kind of hot off the presses. We're just, we're in the middle of this work now, but we've um, either, we've interviewed uh, 35 about uh, Mary Center clients from BRIA uh, and from different aspects of Mary Center's work. And we're hearing a couple of things. One is the importance of, uh, of care in, in their own language, uh, in Spanish in particular, but not exclusively. We're hearing a lot about how important it is to have a welcoming and safe space to come to uh, from you know, Bria students, also from some of the teen program alumni, this idea that this is a welcoming environment. We heard it also from some stakeholders and a couple who people who referred to Mary Center as uh, la, la Clinica de la Familia, so a really familiar, uh, familial place where people felt welcome is important. Um, we heard about uh, healthcare being, or health services, medical services, being the gateway to that more um, kind of fully embracing a different set of services, whether in a mundane way or through crisis care. So team program folks who came in with their mother as a child and then got pulled into a really transformative experience through the team program later. Or women who came in for prenatal care uh, and were pulled into BRIA. Um, and then finally, we heard a lot about uh, you know, this kind of special touch, the special extra effort, um, whether to make sure people that are connecting to uh, their appointments and getting referred and that kind of thing, um, that folks felt like they had a partner in this, in this care. And then finally, um, uh, client level outcomes are, are clearly the big, the big ticket item right, that Mary Center is interested in. But we heard a lot about uh, another set of outcomes in terms of Mary Center's Im impact and influence in the field as a <coughs> sort of a leader in, um, and thought partner and a strategic partner with other service providers, with policymakers here in the DC area to kind of push the envelope and make sure that um, services for this population are, um, are expanded and, in, and improved with time. Um, and so with that, I will stop uh, and happy to answer any questions. And you can seek out uh, the folks who raised their hands too if anyone wants to talk about our work and just to hear more from, Laura, from uh, Christy and Joan. Thank you. So we have just a few minutes for questions, but, um, and I could certainly think of some, but I'd rather turn to those of you out here. You've had a little taste of what is really a very rich mix um, and one that is clearly intergenerational and is growing um, along with the community. So um, any questions from the audience? So while you're thinking about that, I'll take you in just a second. I have a quick question, which is that this takes time. You talked about the inner uh, professional staff. People barely have time to do the jobs they have, let alone spend time hashing out the details of collaboration with others. 
Um, it would be great to just hear very briefly from the two of you what it is about Mary Center that creates the space to do that. Because that's hard work, collaboration, even though we celebrate it, it's not easy. I, I think um, folks at Mary Center really believe in the mission, the vision, and what we're trying to do. So there's an extra effort that's being made by all partners and care coordination team to say we need to talk, let's figure out how to do this, let's try to have huddles, let's, um, we also, we do have the integrated um, medical record, but that's not enough. We'll have, we have times and case review times set aside uh, where we can talk with the, with the other providers. We'll do it either through a conference call or through now we can use Zoom technology <laughs> where we can to communicate with everybody else. We'll shoot a quick email that we have to talk to somebody. But it really is about, or, or, and people know that they can reach out. You know, we really need to talk about this participant. I'm seeing this concern here. Can we just huddle quickly and have this conversation? So in terms of care and care coordination, it's truly, it's truly because the, all, all members of the team, the providers, social services, behavioral health, recognize the importance in communication, and we all recognize our equal role in supporting the best outcome for this participant. So that's what supports us and drives us to move that forward. Great, thank you. Um, saw a couple of hands here. Yes, please. Um, I, I was wondering, um, in terms of the context, in other words, the community and policies and so forth, what, what are some things in, the, in the, the context around St. Mary's that you think have enabled you to do the work that you've done uh, in, uh, in addition to the capacity that you have? What, what's some of the context in the community that's really helped support you do what you're doing? Well, uh, so if, um, in terms of the communities, Mary Center has identified, we don't do it all, and we've identified key partners that share a common vision for our shared community and to support the best outcomes for the communities we're serving. So as we were looking at what the needs are with participants, we, look, we work with advocacy organizations, we partner with our medical providers and Children's Health Center, Children's Law Center. We've partnered with collaborations to improve outcomes for women for maternal health concerns, um, maternal mental health concerns. So, so you, we, uh, we work and we identify shared vision and shared strategies where people want to come together and there's not an ego involved, it's just about getting the best outcomes for the communities and identifying how we can have a voice that has um, shared talking points to lead to the change. And that's really, and then through that advocacy and, and providing testimony, that's another way that we, that we get support and advocate for the change. Great, I, yeah, I think advocacy is very important. If we're not at the table, helping policymakers, helping city council really think about what is best um, in our communities, um, it would be very hard to do this work. Thank you. Uh, maybe one time for one more over here. Hi, good morning. Uh, Robert Burns with City and City Foundation and proud that Mary Center is one of five progress makers selected here locally from the City Foundation. And part of it gets to what you were talking about, but time and time again it comes up and it's cited in some of the documentation. The organizational culture of this organization is very important. I'd like for the folks from Mary Center or even the research to talk about how do you hire for that cultural fit to make sure that as you bring in new staff, new board members even, that you're looking at the culture and the cultural competency of those staff? Good question. There's a lot that goes into hiring. I think that, um, I think that what's um, been very important to, um, to the education piece and to, um, um, yeah, to Bria is the ability to ensure that our participants are the ones that get to be hired to be able to go back and give back. So um, our students are learning the skills so that they can come back and be teachers. Um, we have the medical assistant program because Mary Center realized who better to, to be able to serve our community but our own community. So training our own medical assistants, ensuring, because because they want to give back to their communities and it makes sense to be able to do it that way. I think that's a brilliant place to wrap up because um, that I think is a challenge to the healthcare field at large. 
Um, I am delighted also then to introduce um, our next speaker, um, Kaylon Taylor Clark, who will um, come and introduce our next panel, and you will hear some more voices from the community. Okay. We don't have a. Thank you, everybody, um, for inviting me. I, I wanted to just um, take a moment to say that I'm very honored to be here today as the presenting spon sponsor from Santa Fe. Um, I want to thank Maria in particular for, um, and I, I say this smirkingly, reaching across the aisle in a bit, uh, in, in many ways, to allow Santa Fe to be part of the solution to help the health of all communities. But I wanted to just take one minute and a half maybe two, um, to say that the partnership for us is, or for me, is actually very personal on two fronts. The first is that when I started my career 20 years ago, I started in social determinants of health and health disparities. And at the time, the conundrum was, how do we deal with, at the time, 15% of GDP being spent on health services when 97% of that money and those resources were being spent on health care delivery services, and only three were being spent on this idea of public health or social determinants? Well, it turns out that those numbers haven't changed all that much. But I get to now work in a company that actually allows me to be here today, a pharmaceutical company that allows me to be here today, but that is going beyond just tweeting um, against Roseanne Barr um, and is actually really thinking about finding solutions for patients and communities and trying to really understand that conundrum and get through that. But the second reason that um, this is personally important to me is my own journey. And uh, when I started, I used to give talks. I was doing racial and ethnic disparities, and I'd give these talks about black college-educated women having higher rates of infant mortality than white women with no eighth grade education in the United States. And I'm going to say it again. Black college-educated women with had higher infant mortality rates than white women with no eighth grade education in the United States, a conundrum that was horrifying to me because education was supposed to have this protective factor. So I got married and I started my career about seven years ago and I had a baby who died. And I tell you that because I have a PhD, I have a master's, I had a mother who passed away, a dad who passed away, so here I was by myself. And I was really scared and thinking, how could I have become that woman I used to talk about all the time? How could I actually be this woman? And it occurred to me that I am that woman because I'm part of this community. I am that woman because we're all part of this community. And I'm proud to say now that I have a six-year-old son who is uh, a, a client and a patient of Mary's Center and just got his first dental cleaning there. <laughs> So I just want to say thank you for again allowing us to be here and I'm going to invite our panel to come up and we can start the next session. So, hello, testing, okay. So we're actually here to talk about a bit about the impact of Mary's Center on the community and the patients that they serve. And um, I'm really honored to have this, this board and panel here today. Um, first, I'm going to start at the end with Rodrigo Flores. Rodrigo uh, came from Bolivia in 2007 as a teenager. Is that right, 2007? 2005. 2005, 2005 as a yeah. teenager and be became a patient of Mary Center. He'll talk a little bit about that, um, but now he is working at Mary Center as a data analyst. Very exciting. And this is the kind of thing that we've been talking about today, how a lot of times we bring the patients and volunteers back uh, to work for Mary Center, which really gives this continuum of care that's so very important. Um, the second person we have here is Dari uh, Yudkov-Pogac, and she actually has three children, lives in, in the neighborhood 
uh, of Mary's Center and uh, receives primary care at the center. So she'll be able to give her experience about being a patient there, but also being able to bring her children there. And last but not least, we have Buddy Moore here. And uh, Buddy is the outreach coordinator for the Bernice Fontenot Senior Wellness Center um, and has a lot of idea ideas about how not only where we are at Mary's Center and the importance that Mary's Center serves, but really also thinking about the future and some of the communities and parts of the communities that they could serve further. So I'm very proud to start with that. And I think what I'll do is just start with Rodrigo. Okay. Uh, so the first time I went to Mary's Center as a patient was in 2006. Soon after I arrived from Bolivia, I was 15 years old. And um, uh, I became part of the team program a few months after. Uh, in the team program, I was able to meet kids that had similar experiences than I did, so it was very easy to relate to them. I also made some uh, good friends while I was there. I attended the team program for four years. Um, I also learned English in the team program. Uh, I improved my English, although I never lost the accent. <laughs> <laughs> I still have that. Um, uh, but more importantly, the team program uh, gave me an opportunity, an opportunity that I didn't have anywhere else to realize my true potential that, um, that, um, that I, I didn't know I had before I joined the team program. Um, after I graduated from high school in 2010, I, um, I, I left the team program and I went to community college and then transferred to Towson University in Baltimore where I studied political science and economics. And uh, one day, a few months after graduation, uh, my mom uh, called me uh, saying that she, she was in an, in an event with Maria Gomez. I unexpectedly <laughs> put Maria Gomez on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we, uh, we had a brief conversation and, and she encouraged me to apply for a position at Mary Center. And uh, so I did, I applied for the data analytics position and um, I went through the hiring process and um, I really enjoyed, I actually do enjoy spreadsheets and making graphs <laughs> and all that good stuff. <laughs> so it was perfect for me. And uh, yeah, I mean, after I joined the team program, fast forward to today, it's been a year and a few months. And in the team program, I mean, sorry, not in the team program, but as an employee, yeah. I was able to see the other side that I didn't get to see when I was part of the team program, which is the, all the hard work that the providers, their support staff, and everybody behind the scenes uh, do, and also how much they care about the patients. And that sort of inspired me to, inspires me to today to keep working hard and keep improving, because I realized that all those rows and all those columns and all those measures, they're people, they're people just like me, they're people that uh, come from somewhere else and they need a safe place to be. And that's what Mary Center was to me at first. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, um, can you share a little bit about your experience at Mary's Center? I know you, you live in the neighborhood and um, just how you came to Mary's Center and what it's done for your life and the life of your children. Sure. I actually, I wanted to start, um, I got home from work, I picked up my, I have three kids, six, four, and one. So I pick up a couple of them, you know, from school Wednesday evening. We get home, we have dinner, and my four-year-old is kind of laying on the couch and, oh, I feel her forehead. She's warm, so you know, you, when you're a parent and it's a work night and your kid is sick, what are the thoughts that go through your head? Where's the thermometer? Do I have the right flavor medicine? And um, am I gonna get her a doctor's appointment because I have to go to work tomorrow and I have to figure this out. So I can tell you as a Mary Center patient, that third question is like a no-brainer. Oh, I could call Mary Center 24-hour hotline and I would get an appointment for the next day and if Mary Center is really busy and they can't see me at the location closest to my home. I can go to one of the other four locations in the city. I could email Dr. Schroeder, our <laughs> pediatrician, or accost her at the panel in the morning. <laughs> um, and I would get an answer in, in maybe a couple hours. And that is incredibly unique, at least in the DC area. Um, we came to Mary Center because when we had our first child, we had tried a couple of what I call the downtown pediatric practices, and um, it was okay. I mean, my kids were treated, but you know, then one evening, my son had an ear infection, and you can't take a kid to daycare if they have an ear infection. And let so, and that we were told, oh, we're too busy. We just can't see you till next week. 
And my husband and I said, okay, we can't, this is not working for us. Luckily, a friend recommended Mary Center. And my husband took our son, he's about six months old, we're new parents, you know, we're very, it's very important to us. Healthcare was a big deal. And I remember, I think I had, I was at work, and my husband calls me, says, Dari, oh, Dr. Schroeder was just the best. I mean, she was so good with Raviv, our son. She was so kind and gentle and sweet. And um, we were hooked from that moment. <laughs> And I can tell you that, you know, you, I walk in, I greet, from greeting the um, receptionists to the nurses, to the physician's assistants, to the doctors, every interaction is warm, professional, positive, and we feel like we're part of a community, an amazing community. And we were so happy with the, our pediatric care that um, my husband and I also both switched our primary care to Mary Center as well within a couple of years. Um, and, you know, I just, I can't speak highly enough about the quality of care that we get. And we are so, we're proud to be a part of Mary Center, but we're so grateful also that we can walk in with our kids and the message our kids get is everybody gets this kind of care. It's not even about everyone being entitled or everyone having the privilege, or everyone being lucky, no. This is just a given, that everyone in the waiting room is getting the same excellent care. And that, that to me, is that's a world that all of our kids should grow up in. Mm, Can you wow. just expand a little bit on also, you know, the services that you described? You said, you know, everybody's getting the primary care, this care. But can you describe what you've seen in the community in terms of the other services that people are receiving in, in Mary Center when they come? Uh -huh. So sure, so anecdotally, so, perspective of that, yeah. oh sure, so we live in the neighborhood um, and our kids actually go to a public school that's down the street from Mary Center. So I happen to know that, a DC public school, and I happen, I know I see a lot of my kids' friends in the waiting room. And so I'm, I, you know, talk to parents and I hear about like the mental health services that are available. I see the clothing drives and the food drives. Um, there's free yoga classes. When our location was, um, our school building was under construction, Mary Center actually gave us space so we could have our parent-teacher organization meeting in their space, which was a way for our families to learn more about Mary Center, and I think also just to foster that sense of community. Mm -hmm. Thank you, that's great. Okay. Buddy? Yes. Would, would you like to tell us about your experience with Mary Center, please? Uh, yes, I do use Mary Center for some of my health uh, situations. And what I've found is that you treat it with respect. The facility is always clean and well maintained. There's order. When you come in, you get a number. And when your number is called, of course, you are seen. I'm also a member of the Bernice Fontenot Senior Wellness Center in Ward 1. And Mary Center is the managing entity for the Bernice Fontenot Senior Wellness Center. So I've seen Mary Center from both angles, as a patient and also as a member of the center in which it manages. The, theoretically, there's one wellness center for each ward. However, wards two and three do not have wellness centers. So there are wellness center, senior wellness centers in wards one, four, five, seven, uh, five, six, seven, and eight. And Mary Center manages the center in ward one and the center in ward four. Now a senior wellness center is funded by the Office on Aging and it is managed by a nonprofit organization. The criteria for belonging to a senior wellness center is 60 years of age or older and a resident of the District of Columbia. Those are the only two criteria to become a member. There's no charge for any of the services. Lunch is served free of charge. There uh, is exercise equipment. We have a social worker who comes in once a week. So there are a lot of activities that take place at the wellness center. And uh, we, the youngest person who uh, is a member of our center is 60 years of age. <laughs> the, the, the oldest is 96. 
and the 96-year-old Gwen Barnes. She is a phenomenal woman because she has a memory that is unbelievable. She can talk about things that happened to her when she was five and six years of age, and she's just a phenomenal woman. So the, pro the programs that exist within the Wellness Center in Ward 1 and Ward 4 are programs that are designed to keep seniors healthy, both physically and mentally. Since I've been at the center, I've learned a number of things. That is, I've learned how to maintain my body in healthy condition. I've learned how to eat nutritiously, um, eating things that I didn't especially care for in the past. But our nutritionist <laughs> <laughs> taught us how to, how to cook things in a different way in which they're uh, tasted. <laughs> One of the th things that happened with me, which was very positive, is that I have a, a very serious physical um, vision problem. I have very low vision. I have glaucoma, I have cataracts, and I have dry eyes, so it affects my peripheral vision and my depth perception. Uh, I was introduced to the uh, Prevention of Blindness Society through the, the um, Bernice Fontenot Senior Wellness Center, and I've become very close to that particular organization and they've taught me a number of things that I can do to keep myself safe as I walk the streets. So those are the kinds of things that the Bernice Fontenot Senior Wellness Center through Mary Center bring to our center and probably the Ward 4 Wellness Center also. How many of you have ever visited a Senior Wellness Center? Y'all see the hands? Okay, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Not very, very many, but if you'd like to have a visit and take a, t have a tour, t give us a call. Uh, you can get the number through Mary Center or just call, um, you could call anyone associated with Mary Center and they can give you the number. Give us a call, we'd be glad to take you on a tour of the facility so you can see exactly what the seniors go through in the course of a day. We have approximately 1,200 members at our wellness center. We have members from, I think, the last count was 23 different countries. So we have a lot of interaction among people from various countries, and it's just a wonder to see how well we get along, although we speak different languages and we're from different cultures. So thank you very much, buddy. So you all have a call <laughs> to action now. Um, we'd like to take a couple of questions from the audience. And I think there are people with microphones coming around. Over here. This gentleman here. Uh, good morning. This, um, this question is for Buddy. Uh, my name is David Jackson, DC Office on Aging. Okay. How are you? <laughs> oh, okay. So, okay. And, and my question for you is, uh, what would you like to see more of uh, in terms of activities and programs for seniors in the senior wellness centers, and what other supports uh, does uh, Mary Center need in order to manage uh, Bernice Fontenot and Hattie Holmes? Y yes, what I would like to see specifically is a social worker from Mary Center interacting directly with our members, because I think Mary Center needs more visibility at the center. That is to let people know that the center is managed by Mary Center. We do have a decal on the window <laughs> says that the, <laughs> the center is funded by the DC Office on Aging and managed by Mary Center. But that's the only visibility that Mary Center has on the front. And I would love to have a, well, a social worker who can come and in the process of meeting with our members, actually talk about some of the things that Mary Center offers. Also, I've spoken with Michelle Singleton, who is the director of uh, our center. And I'm hoping that when we bring new members on board, that we can have a brochure that we can give them that outlines the services that Mary Center offers uh, we don't have that at the present time, so maybe, Maria, if you're here, maybe you could put together a brochure that we can actually give to new members 
so they will know exactly what services are offered through Merit Center. Second call to action. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Other questions? I was a teacher, so I can wait. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Hi, Jeff Levine, University of Maryland. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, I guess reporters are paid to ask dumb questions, so here I go. Uh, what happens here in D.C. obviously is special, unique, and you've done an extraordinary job. But if you were to go to Baltimore, where I live, it's a different set of realities, a different demographic, different financial problems. So in other words, how do you take this model here and export it to a place like Baltimore, which in effect would apparently be more difficult? Yeah, that, this is a, a really important question, and I think one that is really what we're trying to solve for here, just thinking about how do you take a program like this, and especially what Rafael was describing around understanding that culture, that texture, the piece that might be unique to what Mary Center has created so far, but what are the pieces that we can take and bring to other places? And I think that's the conundrum, and I'm not trying to shirk your question, by the way, <laughs> but I think it is the conundrum we're trying to solve for here. How, what parts can we take that we can replicate, generalize, and scale? What are the parts that seem unique to what has been created here at Mary Center and in the expansion of such? And then how do we actually allow for localities like a Baltimore to be able to have some flexibility around creating that scale, but then actually making it sustainable? And I think that's a big conundrum, of course, that we have, is the sustainability of something like this, not just the creation. So the question is important. Yeah. I don't know if anyone on the panel yeah. would like to we, describe we something else. We could clone else. Um, Maria Gomez. That's the other option. <laughs> that would have been option two, Maria. <laughs> <laughs> Cloning. <laughs> <laughs> Other thoughts from you all? Uh, I lived in Baltimore for a little while, and, uh, and I think the necessities are always the same, but when people need to find a community where they feel safe and where they can grow and, f and have opportunities that are not available elsewhere. Now, yes, the culture is different, but I think that people are all the same in a way, and uh, I think that's probably the best way to think about it. Thank you. A question over here? Lady in the, <coughs> Lady in the gray. Okay. My name is Mary Alice Akinadewo, and this question is for Buddy. Okay. Buddy, we love you, and I am a member <laughs> of, the <laughs> of, of the Bernie Smart in the Center. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. <laughs> 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 That's hilarious. What is she saying? <laughs> I love you. I love you. I'm here after that. I didn't know. I don't care. Uh, charge number three. Okay, I got it. <laughs> um, my name is Natalie Gonzalez. I actually manage Rodrigo. Uh, <laughs> and my question is to Rodrigo and everyone um, here um, regarding the teen program and its impact on the children, you know, our youth. And a lot of minority po um, populations are, you know, have these issues of violence and gangs and um, just even the burden of not even knowing how to apply to colleges, which is something you know I faced as a first generation American. Um, how has Mary Center helped you and you know all these you know obstacles and barriers that you have had to face? And you know, is this solution for you know other help centers to model? Um, I would think of Mary Center as a sort of an oasis in the middle of a desert for immigrants or anybody who comes from other places where they need uh, help to adapt. And um, the team program in particular allows kids like me to, uh, as I said before, to have those opportunities that are not available elsewhere. And I think that's the most fundamental part of what the team program is. And that has changed my life. It has allowed me to be here. Uh, back in Bolivia, I never thought I would even find a place like Mary Center, let alone be here speaking about it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's, that's what I think everybody deserves a chance, you know? Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, I just have a quick comment there, but okay. um, about Baltimore. They're going, oh, they're going on. About yeah. Baltimore. I'm, I'm from the RCN Foundation. Actually, there's a lot of really exciting things going on all through the country with FQHCs which incorporate a lot of the things that you said. So the problem is being isolated from each other. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, I, Rodrigo, I have a question. Do you have any relationship with the juvenile justice system in the district? And if so, how does, how does that work? 
in I terms of kids that have been uh, part, of, either have been detained or or in that system, in terms that are in need of support services and health care. Is there any relationship that you have with the T program? Yes, I I know that I know of. Okay. Yeah. I know that I know of, yeah. <laughs> there Hi. Yeah. So we do, some of the youth that we serve have been involved with the juvenile justice system. It's not a criteria, but it doesn't mean that someone can't come. And so we continue to provide support. We always tell our participants that this is a safe place to be. We also go through an orientation where we say no weapons, no violence, no gang activity. And folks come and they respect that. Because, they, because I think what Rodrigo very nicely articulated is, this is the oasis. This is where we're at. This is where we can feel safe. And they want to be safe. And they want to be respected. And because they're respected and heard and valued, they stay. And we provide that support for them. Thank you for that answer. And I only have a few minutes left, but I would want to just uh, elaborate a little bit on that. And I see one more hand is that we're also thinking about how do we bring sectors together, right? So the question would be not just for the individuals, but also working with the juvenile justice system and Mary Center to potentially develop some sort of partnership. And I wonder if that isn't the nature of such questions moving forward. Go ahead. Just one other piece, um, not, not necessarily just with juveniles. We do have a pro program, um, another innovation, in a Inside Out Dad. So we are in the jails. Um, working with uh, men that are incarcerated that are fathers and then the idea is through this curriculum then they come out and through our home visiting program led by uh, Fernando Ruiz they can then become partner part of our fatherhood program so they can support their role as a father and attachment to their child recognizing it's not just about income it's about parenting yeah. perfect that's that's good. Not formal relation, not formal relationships. We go and we testify in those kinds of pieces, but we don't do that mm -hmm. yet, per se. <laughs> <laughs> and that's and that's the, and that's the operative. And these are the, this is what we're trying to work for is this multi-stakeholder collaboration, but not just of services. Yes, sir. We have one question left, and I think then I have to wrap it. Okay, okay. One more comment over here, and then this gentleman. My name is Edna Lee, and I'm a member of the Bernice Fontenot Senior Wellness Center, and also the Mary Center, 3912 Georgia Avenue. That's where I go for all my medical. And I can say I am very pleased with the Mary Center, the service I get there, and any time I can call if I'm very sick, they will take me in. And also, I, I can say Ditto to everything that Buddy Moore said about the Mary Center. Yes. I am a member there too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And this gentleman just. This, this gentleman. I'm Shiki Ibarra from the Embassy of Japan. Uh, I have a small question. Uh, what kind of role uh, do you wish towards the federal government to develop your model? So I think what I'm going to do is, I, I think that's an incredibly important question and one that I don't want to have be shirked. And so what I would like to do is reserve the answer to that question for when we have some other leadership coming up here to talk about both Mary Center and their vision for the future in terms of collaboration, both with governments as well as the private sector, as well as others that are in this room. So I very much appreciate um, everyone being here and this panel. Thank you very, very much okay. for being here. Thanks. Thank you. Oh yeah, I can't stand up. We can't stand up. Thank you. Thank you. We have about a ten-minute break, so please refill your coffees, and we'll get started shortly.
everybody. <laughs> We're ready to get started. So good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Maria Marquez, and it's a privilege for me to be here and introducing our next panel, um, Dr. Gita Agarwal, who has been at Mary Center more than 10 years. She's a family medicine provider, and Dr. Ninette uh, Sanai, who is uh, an epidemiologist at NIH since 2000 and uh, who was the research, PI researcher who did all the data collection, quantitative, the beginning of the measurements that Mary Center uh, partnered with. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a pediatrician, I'm the medical director for Fort Totten, and um, I, uh, I, it's an honor for me to be part of uh, this community. My philosophy of health is really embracing health as the really uh, epidemiology, epistemology of the world, right? Health means holy, means everything, means holistic. So I wanna be in a community of practice where uh, we took health as maybe a holistic approach, but really more towards healthcare providing, not disease care providing. So I got a call from one of the providers who is a recruiter in the community, who is really sharing the culture in the community. And I wanna make sure everybody knows he is a mass person in this community and his name is Dr. Cornejo. And because he really embraces the culture and it's really important to understand that Mayor Center embraces a great culture. This is not something that happened in a day, it's 30 years anniversary. It is still evolving, but it's something that it has to be placed into a cultural, sociological, strategic planning. And I think Dr. David, uh, Mr. David Tatro, who is this uh, CEO, talks about this. Is really we all have to understand the culture. We really have to embrace the culture. And when he called, I being a marriage center as a resident in the 90s, from 1995, 1998, I was one of the providers because I was bilingual. Uh, for the teen health programs on Saturdays, because we have one faculty who spoke Spanish, and he always wanted recruiters who didn't have kids, who spoke both languages, and who wants to do teen health on Saturdays. So I was one of them. And when he called me, I said, I'm gonna take a look. And I met this phenomenal team, uh, Dr. Schroeder, who has been here many years, Dr. Elliot, who is really the captain, of the providers. Uh, I met, uh, I knew Dr. Cornejo, and uh, I started meeting the entire community that really matters to do these outcomes and do this phenomenal health. Um, so I also, big believer, I'm a big believer that we have to practice equality health and equity health. So equality means that we all have to treat everybody similarly, right? Uh, with dignity, respect, um, make sure that we make our participants valued, our colleagues valued, and this is part of the Mary Center culture. We all valued, and it makes easier adaptability, it makes easier embracing the culture and really practicing and really working for this mission. The other one is equity, uh, making sure that the people who need the most gets the most. And this is where uh, Mary Center really is ahead a lot of systems uh, because they ask the question, okay, how can I help this to produce equity of health? And uh, it, it's a term in the sociological research uh, that I adopted for health 
but um, this is if you really hear what we're all talking about is really asking the question what the community and population needs and really how we are going to provide these needs and partnering with the community partnering with the government partnering with the city I think that's the behaviors that have to be uh, replicated in different cities and different areas. I had the opportunity to be a more executive board member of a, a nonprofit organization in Rio de Janeiro who also has a, an um, uh, embracing social determinants of health to make sure that we do better health for their population. So when I got the call, I thought there's no brainer. This is a phenomenal place to be and I'm really privileged to be here with you. So I want to ask uh, Dr. Nanette um, Sanai to come. She's going to start presenting some of the data um, that she has uh, from the two-year research and the beginning of this process. And then uh, Dr. Gita Agarwal and I are going to be sitting here. We're going to do some questioning after she finishes. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Marquez, and good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, it's, uh, let's see, oh, good, it's working well. Uh, it's my honor and pleasure to be here this morning to share with you some of our findings from the Mary Center Social Change Model quantitative research study that we've been working on the last, uh, last few years. And just a caution, this is a scientific talk. Uh, first, <laughs> okay, well, let's see. Maybe I should move a little bit. Great. Great, thank you. Uh, so first, a disclaimer uh, that any reference to the NIH Clinical Center or to me should not be viewed as endorsement of Mary Center, its products or services. All right, uh, so as many of you may be aware, the National Institutes of Health located nearby in Bethesda, Maryland, includes 28 institutes, each emphasizing special uh, certain diseases and health research. Um, what is, uh, this is the clinical center, it's one of the institutes, it's also the hospital itself. And it is the world's largest research hospital. And this is where I work as an epidemiologist statistician. I'm currently involved in about 35 different research studies and have co-authored more than 75 scientific publications. I've collaborated on this study with Mary Center as part of my independent research, where my interests are in epidemiologic uh, studies in different populations. Now let's finally discuss the study. So since its conception, uh, Mary Center adopted a holistic, multi-point approach to helping individuals and families, and thus came about the social change model with its mission to, um, uh, to build better futures uh, through the delivery of healthcare, education, and social services. Over the years, the social change model has evolved to incorporate comprehensive team health, dual generation education, social services, dental health, and mental health. The way each of these is defined, I'm having a tough time advancing these. Maybe it's because I'm behind the, all right, there we go. Um, so the uh, comprehensive team health is, uh, component is defined as all medical, nutrition, nurse, and health promotion visits. The dual generation education includes the BRIA public charter pr a school that we've heard about this morning. The social services program All right, includes uh, the family social work program, the, ho hem the home program, the team program, and the BHAP program. Dental health includes all dental health care, and mental health includes all mental health and behavioral health. So the fundamental question is, does this model make a difference? So we quantitatively um, wanted to evaluate the impact of the social change model on the health of Mary Center patients or participants. And our primary research question was, do those who utilize a social change model have better health outcomes than those who don't? 
Um, utility of uh, the social change model was defined as those receiving comprehensive team health um, services in addition to any of the other services, and that's how we define, that's the social change model, compared to those who only seek comprehensive team health services. And our hypothesis was whether utilizing uh, the social change model is protective against various um, adverse health outcomes than utilizing comprehensive team health only. Just a sneak peek at some of the, the findings. Uh, based on the data that we analyzed, utility of the social change model was protective against certain adverse health outcomes, uh, again, than use of comprehensive team health only. And this appeared to be true for hypertension, obesity, diabetes, and high cholesterol. So how did we do this study? Uh, data from uh, electronic health records were available starting in 2009 and from then until 2016 were extracted for this study. The presence of CDC and WHO uh, public major adverse health outcomes were assessed and were defined um, in the following ways. Diabetes was one of the um, outcomes we assessed, was based on hemoglobin A1C and any medication use. Cardiovascular risk factors based on various lipids were um, assessed, and um, as well as use of any lip lipid-lowering medications. All right. Um, hypertension was based on blood pressure and any antihypertensive medications. Obesity was based on BMI. Data analysis involved um, the review and analysis of almost a million in anonymized and de-identified encounters to determine service utilizations and to determine the prevalence um, of the outcomes that we were assessing. And we use adjusted logistic regression statistical models to analyze the data. For the years 2009 through 2016, the total number of annual encounters are shown in orange, and the distinct patients they represent are in blue. As you can see, during Mary Center has grown tremendously just in the last, those eight years represented here, and that's with the opening of new centers and expansion of services. Generally, the patient cohort was about two-thirds adults, and so for this part of the study, we focus on the adult patients only. Pediatric patients have different criteria and considerations, and that'll be the topic for another day. For this presentation also, we focus on the two ends of this spectrum, the beginning and end of the study duration, the years 2009 and 2016. So the data I present today, <laughs> or hope to present today, Well, just to be fair, this is the first presentation with slides, so <laughs> I don't know if, yeah, I don't know if we can get that turned on. I don't think I turned it off. This is the laser pointer. <laughs> okay. So, uh, well, we're going to go through some of these again, I guess. I don't know if they can be advanced. I don't know if anyone is, okay. Okay, we're almost there. Good yeah, <laughs> exactly, just in case, you know, if you missed anything I said. Okay, so pop quiz, what were the, the adverse outcomes we, we were assessing? Okay. <laughs> All right, okay. So here we are. So we focused on the 2009 and 2016 data, and that actually also presents an interesting opportunity to see any changes during this eight-year time frame that took place. So this table here um, shows the percentages of the service utilizations. So of the 36,000 encounters in 2009, most of them were for comprehensive team health, as you can imagine, followed by social services and some of the other programs, the education, dental health, and mental health. 
by 2016, there was quite a bit of a shift in that of the 101 encounter, 1,000 encounters in 2016, again, comprehensive team health was, um, was a majority of the encounters, but then it was followed by dental health, mental health, and then social services and dual generation education. And part of this has to do with the expansion of services. Now, when considering um, the percentages of patients who utilize the combination of services, the social change model, um, of the 7,000 uh, patients in 2009 and of the 18,000 patients in 2016, about a quarter of them utilized the social change model, leaving the rest to comprehensive team health. There were, these don't add up to 100% because there were some patients that used single services, for example, dental health care only or social services. And so because there was no um, health data related to that, we couldn't include them in this study. So they're excluded from this particular analysis. Um, in this table, uh, we see the prevalence or the presence of the major health adverse um, outcomes. And uh, again, there seems to be a shift from 2009 to 2016 in that um, diabetes increased from 2009 uh, to 2016 in terms of its occurrence in the patient population at Mary Center. Um, high cholesterol, triglyceride, and also obesity by quite a bit. Um, there was a decrease in, uh, low, uh, in low HDL, that's the good cholesterol, and in hypertension. And so future steps in this study certainly involves looking into the reasons for these changes over time. In comparing health outcomes between those who utilize the social change model and those who did not, uh, we also have to consider some of the patient characteristics. The demographic data are sh for 2009 and 2016 are shown on this slide. And uh, generally speaking, the patient cohort tended to be primarily female of uh, Hispanic ethnicity, uh, most of the white and unreported racial um, uh, descriptions actually corresponded to Hispanic uh, ethnicity. Um, there were very few with private insurance, um, and they were mostly in the, in the 30s. Um, so when we separate these by those who used the social change model and those who did not, uh, there were some slight differences um, here and there that we had to account for. Um, generally speaking, those who use the social change model, at least initially, again, tended to be female and more of the Hispanic ethnicity. Uh, they also tended to use public insurance more, and they tended to be slightly younger. And obviously, they had more encounters because they were utilizing the social change model. So um, all of these were adjusted for when assessing the association between social change model use and the adverse health, health outcomes that we were um, assessing in this study. So um, I did warn you, it's a scientific talk, but I'll make this as easy as possible. So this slide pictorially um, shows the adjusted risks for the adverse outcomes that we assessed in this study, comparing the social change model versus the, uh, the patients who use the comprehensive team health services only. Uh, let me take a moment to briefly describe what we're looking at. So odds ratios are a way of measuring risk, and they are what is represented on the, uh, on the x-axis. That's the horizontal line at the bottom. Um, the dashed line in the middle represents the null, which basically means uh, no differences in risk between the two groups that we are uh, comparing. Any odds below that uh, represents lower risk or is protective against um, the outcomes that we're looking at. And anything above represents increased risk. The odds ratios for each of the, um, the uh, health, adverse health outcomes that we're looking at are represented by the circles along with the 95% confidence intervals. Now, when these confidence intervals do not cross that middle line, the, the null, it is what's called statistically significant, which means that the observations are not by chance and they're supported by the data and scientific evidence. So as can be seen here in 2009, the, um, those who used the social change model were at lower risk for diabetes, high cholesterol, and hypertension, and therefore were protected against these adverse health outcomes. 
uh, the other, um, the other uh, adverse health outcomes were not statistically significant. In 2016, we also see lower risk and a protective um, effect for hypertension and obesity for those who utilize a social change model compared to those who only use healthcare services. So uh, there was a slight shift in, um, in some differences in these two years. Um, but what remains uh, consistent is the hypertension. So now let's recap the study findings. So based on the 2009 and 2016 cross-sectional data, utility of the social change model was protective against certain health um, outcomes, uh, certain adverse health outcomes, uh, then use of comprehensive team health only. And this appeared to be true for hypertension for obesity, diabetes, and high cholesterol. So to answer our fundamental question of, does the social change model work? Does it make a difference? Service utilization appears to be related to certain health outcomes, as we've seen with the data and also what the patients have um, described and um, explained uh, to us this morning. Uh, those who use multiple services may be more likely to achieve uh, better health outcomes. And in the context of Mary Center and in this first round of analyses, the social change model appears to have a positive impact on the health of its participants, but remains to be confirmed. Uh, there uh, certainly um, is a lot of work that still remains. We need to complete the remainder of the analysis and also look at the pediatric data and see what story that conveys. Uh, there is the longitudinal studies that also need to take place to help us relate things better. Um, and there certainly are challenges and limitations in that um, that we're not necessarily able to address with the data that we have. Uh, this is a very transitional population. Um, about 15 to 20 percent of the patients represented in 2009 were also still in the system, in the data in 2016. Uh, there may be external care that they're receiving that we might not be able to capture or account for. Uh, that's outside of Mary Center. Um, also, there could be unmeasured behaviors uh, that could impact these same outcomes that we're looking at that we couldn't assess with the data. Um, we don't know about the social structure of the patient cohort and also precisely who are the ones who use a social change model or are able to use a social change model from the data. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time. Uh, thank, special thanks to the NIH Clinical Center for supporting me in this work. Very special thanks to the entire Mary Center team, the providers, the staff, the patients, um, and also Mary Center Advisory Committee. Thank you. Exhaustive uh, presentation. Um, we, we're going to ask a few questions. I want to make sure that um, we emphasize on the interprofessional team approach for health, um, trying always to really provide health care and less to provide disease care. Um, and we are beginning to measure some of the outcomes for uh, future evolving process of the, of the system that Mary Center already created 30 years ago. Again, I, being um, a Mary Center on and off, I would say, for many years, and the, the system today is something that is unbelievable, impressive. And I think the numbers and um, the, the different research that have been um, done for the last few years is going to show this and more uh, in the near future. So thank you. So I'm going to start with Dr. Argawal. So I want to ask you, you know, what is your perspective about teamwork, um, interprofessional um, support that you have for your mainly chronic disease patient, but a any participant that comes to your office and your practice? Can you comment on that, please. So when this study was presented to me, I was not shocked. I wasn't even surprised. I mean. <laughs> Ideally, you wouldn't even want to have numbers involved in medical care, but unfortunately, we need to, uh, or fortunately. Uh, so that, um, you know, the patients that I've had, and I've been here 10 years, so I've grown older with them. I've seen their diseases progress, because there is this 
natural progression of disease. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that does happen. And their needs change. A diabetic who was controlled on oral medicine before and could go to work like any normal person, once they need insulin, will be dizzy at work and will not be able to be a dishwasher and carry all the dishes on a two-story restaurant. And to break that news to them that you cannot live without your insulin is, is not going to apply. They're not going to take their insulin. And you'll see it in the numbers. And I see that. They're not taking it. And then to have them talk to a mental health therapist who's available there and then, who explains to them you know, learn coping skills that this is how it's going to be. And then to be able to talk to the social worker who's there and use their services to help patient talk to the HR, use uh, their well-earned PTO, their FMLA. Because these are hard processes. There's a lot of paperwork involved. Only a social worker can sit down with them and even help me write a letter for on the patient's behalf. And it's only when they have this all set is they're going to truly take their insulin. And then we do see the results. When they have the whole socioeconomic part of it fixed is when we see the results. And it's same for a stroke patient. I can send them to physical therapy. If their apartment building doesn't have a ramp, they can't use their walker. They're embarrassed to tell me why they didn't go to PT and are not going back to work anytime soon. But you know, if we don't fix that, they, they cannot avail that physical therapy that's out there and their insurance covers for it, but how do you go there? So, you know, having these people available on site helps me help the patient right there and then. Thank you. Um, so that emphasizes that to, for us providers to rem remember that 90% of the disease process of our participants is really social and behavioral health or mental health. Not necessarily um, diseases that are, have a criteria, of diagnostic criteria. So thank you for sharing those moments. So I, I think, I, and as a provider also, I can testify that it's easier to practice with this interprofessional team uh, with you know, us taking care of providing <coughs> health care. We cannot do it alone. And we all matter to do better outcomes for them. Thank you. So we're going to go back to Dr. Sanai. Um, thank you for, again for presenting your data, uh, preliminary data. But I want to ask you, what will be the next steps of the research? And uh, how would you predict that we can have some numbers or processes to replicate this, maybe in Baltimore, uh, maybe in Atlanta, or maybe in New Mexico? any city there, Albuquerque or uh, uh, Santa Fe. S and how do you predict that we can do this longitudinal assessment that you mentioned here? Well, the longitudinal assessment within the Mary Center context um, would involve, um, you know, as I mentioned, this is a very transitional population. And, and the way we first uh, analyze these data are based on a cross-sectional study, which means that we looked at the outcomes and the service utilization at the same time within the same year. Now, we don't know exactly what happened first, if they had the adverse outcome before they utilized a social, social change model or the other way around. But we know that we, you know, with these data, we established that there seems to be a, a clear association. So now in terms of teasing apart some of the timing of these, that's when the longitudinal studies would be needed. And would the, I mean, ideally it would be to follow them, follow the patient throughout time and see what they utilize and how that directly impacts some of the, their health outcomes. Mm -hmm. Now in terms of in other settings, um, well, uh, I mean, there, I guess, I mean, if there is something similar to a social change model, or um, if we can compare to other communities that, um, that don't have the social change model and compare the health status of the patients there versus here, you know, those are ways that we can definitely compare uh, with other settings. But in terms of replicating these data in a different context, if there are other settings that also utilize a similar system, we can see if their findings are also consistent with ours. Good, thank you. So we're going to go back to Dr. Agarwal. Um, 
I want to ask you one more thing is, you know, our payers have priority to pay more fee for services today. Uh, we're all working on social determinants of health and how we're going to um, do better for the communities and maybe value um, factors or maybe population health. Um, so how do you see Mary Center team approach and support uh, and health in with their own mission and the three pillars will uh, or are impacting your, pa your participants in your offices? So, so as the study shows, people who have used the social care model or multidisciplinary system have done well. But it's true that in insurances or or donors or you know wherever our funding comes from have a hard time putting money into a nutritionist or a mental health therapist or a health educator because the outcomes don't seem to be there however with a study like this we can now prove in numbers that it does impact like putting the money in beforehand is looks like a hard start but if we can save money in the end where we don't have patients who will eventually get stroke mm -hmm. or dialysis, we're saving a lot of money mm -hmm. in the future. Yeah. So it's a, it's a healthcare providing system and I, we all appreciate to be here. We're gonna open uh, the questions to the audience, to the providers and uh, uh, we wanna ask you questions. There is one here. Hi, uh, it's not a question, it's just a comment that I think is important. I, I think this research shows um, uh, incre it's very different from 2006 to 2016. But also I'd like to remind you guys that the ICE was created in 2003 and the whole, and since now our community has been targeted by immigration law that's deporting a lot of people. So I know this study was not meant to understand the social determinants beyond uh, the integration of the services in Mary Center, but it's incredible how the risk that people is at is much higher in 2016 than it's 2006. And I think I just want to make a comment that the immigrant community is under a lot of stress for the last 10 years with the creation of those enforcements of, and now recently even a <laughs> uh, very um, uh, incredibly unjust way of dealing with immigrants and health is impacted by it. So. It is a very important comment, and even obesity has uh, the numbers that we have here. They're not just for Mary Center numbers, it's really national numbers. So they have duplicated in the last few years. Uh, another question here. Hi there, my name is Lia Salasis. Um, I'm with the National so Association of Community Health Centers. I work on their federal affairs team, and I thank you all for being here today. Um, I just had two questions, actually one of the follow-up. Um, if your study took, account, took into account um, any social terms of health, and specifically like kind of which types, um, and then as a follow-up question to that, uh, for participants that did participate in the social change model, which programs were most utilized by those adults, and if those had any significant impact um, in their health care, any of the um, health diseases that you were monitoring? Thank you. Um, thank you for that question. Those are some of the details that will be teased apart in trying to understand you know, trying to understand who it is that utilizes a social change model and how that impacts their health. Um, generally speaking, I mean, the comprehensive team health services were the ones that were primarily used. Um, and, and really, when we um, look at the, the patient population and how they used and what combination of services were used, it, again, just follows that same kind of description that I showed with a service utilization in that mostly it tended to be comprehensive team health, dental health, and mental health. Um, but there is, we are actually exploring some of the other combinations and determining, uh, you know, kind of a gradient effect of, well, is it just one or two services that makes the impact? Is it, is the, is the improvement seen in those that utilize all services? How is that working out? So those are things that are part of the, this, you know, more intense, detailed analysis and trying to understand our findings and place them in context. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have a few seconds for uh, Hi, Jennifer Brooks, Project Evident. Um, I just had a question about whether you had any controls in that study. So 
you had some ability to it looks like to tell who was in the social change model versus not what what all could you control for was there much in there we and if not then it'd be helpful to hear from the practitioners about what you know about who goes into mm -hmm. the social change model versus not yeah well the best um, control group I mean in a scientific study you have to have a control group that we could come up with here other than uh, comparing to another community and how they fare in terms of their their outcomes uh, the best one we could come up with um, given the the rich data that we had and that you know Mary Center patients this this social change model is there available and every patient has the opportunity to utilize them was to compare to those who don't utilize them within the same setting so that we keep differences similar as much as possible so then that's how we defined um, for this study, the use of the social change model, which included comprehensive team health and any of the other services, compared to those that don't use any of the other services, but come in for their health because we do need the health outcomes to compare them to each other. And so, and so obviously, you know, they were um, um, uh, adjusted for ethnicity, for gender, for age, um, and for the number of encounters because uh, when they come in and use the social change model, they obviously come in for more encounters, have more encounters than those that don't. So all of those were adjusted for in really being able to take those into account and in determining whether the association existed. So I want to thank uh, Dr. Sanai and Dr. Argwal for uh, their answers and discussions. Uh, we're going to introduce uh, Lodi Aaron. Nice to see you. She's going to present the next uh, panelist and introduce them. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm Lottie Aaron. I'm a senior fellow here at the Urban Institute, and um, I have the privilege of moderating the final panel for this morning. Um, and we are really going to be widening the lens of this discussion and um, focusing on the future of community health centers like Mary Center in uh, the nation, in communities across the country in what is a very complex uh, landscape of both health care, health, uh, social service delivery. Um, but uh, as we've heard this morning, there are some amazing things that are happening at Mary Center that I think uh, lots of different groups and entities across the country can be learning from. Um, so we've heard from two of our three panelists this morning. I'm going to start with the person we haven't heard from yet, <laughs> Maria. Congratulations on this milestone for Mary Center. And <laughs> so uh, I'm interested, you know, as the founding leader of this uh, amazing. Uh, center that you started and as you are starting to think about the next 30 years of this organization what are some of your reflections about what you've heard this morning and are there some additional things that you really want to be sure that we all take away from what we've learned and need to continue to learn so I think first of all I just want to say the first thing that I heard and keep hearing from everyone is the great staff that we have. And I could mention all the staff that is here, but I think um, we, if three people could actually stand up or raise their hands, Dr. Elliot, um, Tali Elliot is our Chief Medical Officer, David Tetro, our Chief Operating Officer, and Dara Koppelman, our Chief Nursing Officer, and you heard from Joan, who is our program, uh, Chief Program Officer. And there's so many of you here, and some of you were mentioned by the clients and uh, interacted. I could be here all morning, but um, those are the folks that really um, 
are taking the pulse, that are, are in the community, that are talking to staff, that are um, demanding and, and, and also supporting all of you to, to, to make what Mary Center is. Uh, so thank you. Thank you. I, I sort of uh, ride on your shoulders. I, I hope I don't get heavier and heavier. <laughs> 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 but, uh, but thank you for, for, for making my dream, and I think for more important for our community being at a better place because each and every one of you. So thank you. Um, I think the second thing I, I would say that came out today is um, we can have all the technology in the world, and we do. And I think David and many of you will say that you know we have to have the greatest and latest, and we have to look good, and we have to be presentable, and we have to you know, do all these things. But at the end of the day, what I heard today is that is all for nothing if there's no compassion, if there is not a sense of mission, if you don't own what you do. So own what you do, not only own the organization that you work with, but also own what you do every day. Um, and I think I heard that in integrated services, that, that what you do every day, um, whether it's our, our staff, whether it's our volunteers, our supporters, all of you, uh, actually transform lives every day in this community. Uh, I think the third thing I heard is, um, you know, it's, it's great to bring new talent and so many of you are new talent to Mary Center. We were just talking to, to David. Uh, he came in in 2009, and there was this huge growth because I had a, all of a sudden there were all these chiefs, okay? <laughs> um, so it's great. Um, so, but, but I think also, you know, bringing good new talent as well as bringing talent that is already in the community is very, very important. The people that really have been through and have walked those shoes, right? Um, and, uh, and, um, and so I think the other is around partnerships. Um, for each and every one of you here who is our partner, um, who we take the privilege and the honor to honor you here today, um, is so important. Those partnerships that could have never been done without you, um, in starting with Bria, who was part of us and now is our partner, uh, Han, and, and um, to Children's Hospital, to the MCOs, and on and on and on, I can mention every single one of them, including the advocacy agencies that work with us to make sure Children's Law Center, the DC Physical Policy Institute, um, the Urban Institute, uh, that make it possible. And then um, I think the last, that, well, two, two other things, that, 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 there's, that this, this model, if anything, is maybe um, it, it's, uh, the, the cost is maybe uh, expensive. And we, we, well, not maybe, it is expensive. Expensive in the sense of expense up front, right? So the MCOs, some of you may be in the room here today, will tell us we love your outcomes. You, we wanted to work with you. We started telemedicine because of that. We started care coordination because they, they love the work, our results. Um, there is a cost to it, but the bottom line at the end of the day is that you pay it at the front end or you pay it at the, at the other end and it's gonna be more costly. So you're the experts, you know what I'm talking about. I think it's really, really important to realize that none of this can't be done, none of it can be done without funding. Um, and to continue to make sure that, that um, we're going outside those four walls. And then the last one I would just say is, I think today we heard that um, from maybe from Baltimore to Japan, that this model needs to be replicated and um, needs to be replicated. Um, we don't need to reinvent. Uh, HRSA has spent a lot of money on a community health center like this one into the 1,200 or 1,300 that they have throughout the country. Um, and each one of those, those dollars that are spent at the federal level need to be, you know, 10 times fold in terms of not reinventing the wheel and creating something new. Uh, there's innovation is great, but what is, what is happening right now is something that needs to be replicated. Thank you. Um, Rafael, thank you for your opening remarks. I was taking a lot of notes throughout that. Um, they were very insightful. As somebody who has really spanned both the public and private sectors in this area, I'm curious about what some of your thoughts are about the cross-pollination that can happen between those two sectors in both directions and what some of your biggest takeaways are and advice to you know those of us that are here thinking about the work that community health centers uh, are doing across the country, but also how 
what they're doing can be brought to other parts of the healthcare system because I think so many things that we heard today would be the envy of many other systems. Absolutely. Uh, well, a couple of things, especially as I listened to all the different speakers throughout the day, um, reminded me of a couple of things. And one of them was s sort of the, the need to remember um, that at least the United States has been at the forefront of scientific research and investing early and often in the life of children under five years of age. And I was reminded over and over of that, including in the last presentation when you were talking about the scientific research. And I thought, look, we have produced the world's research confirming brain, brain science and brain development science. And many other countries are taking that brain science and that brain research and running with it. And we have to remember what that means, which is that for children under the five years of age, right, the brain is developing at an extraordinary pace. And it's only recently that we're learning again that in early adolescence, there's another phase of development. And we're looking at how the, 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 the brain, not only in its nascent stages, but in, in early adulthood, is shaping the decisions we make. And as Maria just so eloquently pointed, when we invest early on, we don't spend on prisons and the juvenile justice complex and homelessness and joblessness and all those things. And so I think that hearing the various panels reminded me of it needs to be said over and over and over the importance of investing on prevention early and often. And our greatest marker or indicator of that investment really is for children under five years of age. That's not to the exclusion of seniors or young adults, but it's to say that we get a bigger bang for our buck. And I think the next iteration of this work is about articulating more globally the return on the investment, um, which I think is something that's very hard to do for nonprofit organizations. And I've seen that across sectors. So in terms of sectors, um, we have come up from a world that's deeply divided in silos, right? A nonprofit organization, a public sector organization, cities, counties, states, feds, a private sector organization. But at, at this day and age, we are looking at cross-sector innovation. Uh, we're looking at private organizations oftentimes providing government services and an MCO. We're looking at the way in which um, uh, government services um, are expected to be delivered in a different way. And globally, people in a variety of surveys national, internationally are talking about expecting more from their, from their civil society, both from their governments as well as their nonprofit organizations. And when they see seamlessness or frictionless, like I talked about earlier, in the private sector through things like apps, why wouldn't you expect that for DMV or for healthcare services? And so I'm watching and I've seen this trend about the need to expect excellence at every single level. And I think that's the next iteration for this, for this research and for this work, is really using the brain science, understanding the investment of prevention early and often, and taking the best of other sectors and trying to scale far more rapidly than, than we've been able to do. I think the last point I wanna make is about the funding piece that Maria mentioned, which is that during the break I was talking with Stuart about the things that are not sexy to invest in, but are critical to understanding the, what this entire day has been about. So the infrastructure in investing in data and understanding data analytics so that our doctors can actually put information into a record once and have it multi populate in multiple records, whether it's the mom or the child or the after school team program, that takes money. It's not a ribbon cutting shot, but you have to invest in data infrastructure. And so why, why that matters is these things that oftentimes are the hardest to fund are the things that are able to help Mary Center prove the case that this change model really does work. And we're on the precipice now of really thinking through what that next part of the research is gonna take us and how it'll evolve over time in the next couple of years. Thank you. Just yes, add, please. Ribbon cutting is also good. No, it is, <laughs> it is. <laughs> It is. She has a role. <laughs> Mine is different. We're gonna <laughs> yes, funders, please fund Maria to do ribbon cutting. <laughs> and some of you are here in the audience, the yeah. Wimbledon Foundation and others, of so course. thank you so much for all that you do for that. But obviously, you, that what you're speaking is the building itself would, would, is not sufficient, so you're right. It's complicated. And Stuart, um, you also occupy a very special place on this panel as someone who runs a monthly round table at Brookings where you are bringing uh, thought leaders together across sectors to think about these very issues and you also serve on Mary's Center Board. Um, I'm curious what your thoughts are. I know you think about ROI and the financing models and the co the how to really think about this our, our system and, and new ways of supporting and sustaining the kind of work that Mary's Center has been doing for decades. So. 
some reflections from you. Yes, uh, as you said, in my, uh, in my day job when I'm not working for Maria, um, <laughs> <laughs> I do. I think a lot about sort of what are some of the long-term implications and how, and how can we replicate this. And I think two or three, well, three or four things come, come to mind from the conversation. I want to build a little bit on what uh, Raphael said. The first is that as we've done in this evaluation so far, it's not sufficient to look at data only. You've got to look at mixed methods. You've got to look at what's actually going on in an organization. So the survey work is very important. You can only get a full picture of something like uh, Mary Center by looking at it in different ways as an analyst. Mm -hmm. And that's what's so important, I think, about the, the research that's been done so far and that we're moving ahead with. Uh, I think secondly, related to the data itself, uh, one of the things we see in these monthly meetings that you often uh, come to um, is that actually getting, to the extent we're looking at data, getting the data you need uh, can be very challenging in all kinds of ways. Um, you know, it, it's very difficult sometimes to share data across sectors. There's lots of privacy issues. There's sometimes there's just uh, the way data is collected on the same person by two different uh, sectors can be completely different, so it's really difficult to do that. Uh, well also, uh, I think, really important in, in regard to what Mary Center and Bria is doing, we also need to be able to, to accumulate much more longitudinal data in this. You know, a lot of things are happening uh, with the parents and the children at Mary Center. From other research, our guess is that the biggest impact of that is going to show up often years in the future, maybe at high school, maybe even in college. And yet, it's very difficult for us here at Mary Center and elsewhere to keep that data, uh, to get that data. I know Bria is focusing a lot now on, on looking at what happens to their children when they leave Bria because that's really what you what you want. So I think that's another kind of issue that, that comes up, which is very important here. I'd say thirdly, uh, when we think of the social change model, uh, the impact goes in both directions. Uh, Dr. Sinai's work, of course, is looking at what do the social services and others, what impact does that have on the health of the person? But also the reverse is important. The, the work that's done in the healthy, what does that imply for how somebody's going to succeed in school, what's going to happen in their life, uh, and so on. And we're beginning to, uh, here at Mary Center to sort of dig into that. I actually just want to recognize uh, Sophie Martinez. If Sophie would just stand up, don't be bashful, just, just stand up. <laughs> so, Sophie is um, actually at the Department of Health and Human Services at the federal level and also at the University of Maryland. And uh, she's begun as a volunteer to kind of work on another aspect of this, is, which is looking at these individuals that, that um, Dr. Sinai was talking about, who are getting both the health care mm -hmm. and the social services, what happens to them later in the areas of education, of employment, and so on? And we have it just at the moment, just a very small data set that doesn't allow Sophie to, to really draw too much from that, but she's also looking at what does some of the other research suggest in that area. So we've got a lot of suggestive research mm -hmm. that means that we need to start focusing on what happens in these other areas. And then the last thing really comes from that, I think, uh, picking up on the point about budgeting and payment. Um, when we have our, our monthly meetings at, at, at Brookings, it doesn't take long for people to start complaining, not about Brookings, but complaining about how the payment systems and the budget systems do not align with what we increasingly understand needs to happen. Uh, and now doing return on investment work helps because I think when you go to somebody who's in charge of budgets or in a federal committee or in an agency and, and you're able to start showing the broader multi-sector impacts of this of these kinds of interventions then it's you can you can have a better chance of getting budgets to reflect that also it's very important to allow flexibility in funding so Medicaid for example and Medicare actually uh, is going down the direction of making that money a lot more flexible in terms of how it can be used. And we see that at Mary Center, we have the flexibility, but we also see the obstacles where payment changes still need to be made. So getting the data to demonstrate to agencies of the federal government or the state uh, to encourage them to allow money for healthcare to be very flexible is really uh, uh, very important. So that whole approach of, of uh, looking at, at how we utilize this to affect policies, what well, I'm obviously focused on, and I think really comes out of that. If we can make those policy changes in conjunction with getting the data that, and the mixed methods research that we are talking about here today, 
other FQHCs and other places around the country, I think we'll be able to replicate what we, what we do, whether or not Maria is actually heading them. Uh, and that's really very important, I think, in, in this whole, uh, whole area. I think that's a great point. I think some of that misalignment is both what we call the wrong pocket yeah. problem, um, which is that you know investments in in healthcare may have savings in homeless services right. or justice programs on, and then there's the issue of the time horizons right. and budgets and political decisions are often made on a much shorter timeline when it takes longer to really track and see the. Uh, optimal aspects of those early interventions, um, early in the life course, prevention, all of that. I'm curious about, you know, we talked a little bit about the role of technology and innovation kind of when it comes to um, actual service delivery and matching needs to delivery, but I wonder if there's a technological and innovation aspect to the financing and the tracking of um, what needs to happen uh, from a kind of broader systems funder perspective. Do any of you have any thoughts on that? Sure. Sure. Uh, I think, well, the, the answer is yes, um, <laughs> uh, uh, and profoundly so. I think that Maria mentioned, you know, you can have all the coolest, newest toys, mm -hmm. and that doesn't an outcome make. We get that. However, the bar for what is acceptable technology innovation in the social sector and in government is extraordinarily low. So for example, let's just take an issue like child welfare in America. Some of the most complicated cases, a child is being removed from a family's care, either temporarily, either reunited with their family of origin, with kin, or adopted or fostered. Bottom line, the way in which things are tracked are most often by paper. Uh, and uh, this is one of the roles I had in the previous administration, and I've actually seen it live. People on the back of envelopes doing their child welfare visits on determining removals. This kind of acceptance of back of the envelope um, calculations should not be acceptable in the 21st century. There's technology that can capture this, and that is not to replace the human eye-to-eye -eye interaction that you have to do to solve complex human problems, but it is to say that there are countless ways that you can capture interviews or how artificial intelligence can gather data. Think about the, the one mil under one million records that our scientists looked at to come up with their conclusions. Imagine for a moment if in the background one could imagine algorithms or artificial intelligence gleaning information such that you can make better decisions on a more timely basis. So why is it that I can travel as I do every week for work and my phone can recognize that I'm in a particular place and tell me the estimate of how long it'll take me to get to the hotel at one in the morning and the meeting at eight in the morning? Why is it that my phone can recognize that? That same concept of technology innovation can and should be applied in a different way. Now, there are massive ethical complications and ethical implications for this, for this matter. But what's interesting to me about this sector in terms of um, crossing private, public, and social sector is we stop the conversation by saying it's about privacy. You can't share that data. And that, to me, is generally an indicator of we don't want to have that conversation. And the fact is, is that when we had that conversation, we advanced the field, we advanced the work. And so I've recently been thinking a lot about, for people who often will say, and throughout my career, particularly in public sector, it's the no team. You try to pitch a new idea and they'll say, well, we can't do that, the reg doesn't say that. Or no, you can't do that, the rule doesn't allow us. And I'll say, well, where in the rule, or where in the regulation, or where in the law does it say you cannot do that? Point to that exactly. And then ask yourself, well, how do we share information? Guess what? Across the social change model, you are informally sharing information at Mary Center, just like so many other practitioners right. do. And you do it oftentimes without the permission of the person, unless they've signed something. So I'm not saying that's a bad thing. That's our reality. So we should embrace that reality and ask us, how can technology innovation solve our problems, not the other way around, not just buying the new tool or the new shiny, the new shiny toy. It's really around actually helping shape the way in technology and innovation should, should be existing in, in our communities. And never forgetting that the most complex human problems are going to be solved human to human, face to face, eye to eye. And how we can leverage that work with tech innovation, I think that's really what we have to head to in this next generation of our work. And I, I would just make two quick points about, about uh, areas of technology. I think monitoring technology mm -hmm. so that we know what's going on with somebody. Uh, we have now smart pills that you, people can take. Uh, that is really good for, for, for checking on what's happening with the elderly or people who have got all kinds of conditions. We do a lot of work in the area of telemedicine uh, uh, in uh, 
uh, at Mary's Center. And even innovations in things like, uh, as I learned, uh, that we now can maintain blood without it having to be refrigerated by not so much technology but by but chemical interventions so that now we can do a lot more. Uh, a, a medical system can go out and do a lot more visits uh, without having to come back and get the blood uh, uh, refrigerated. And the whole area of telemedicine I think is just so open to incredible innovation in terms of how we deliver services and monitor and work with people and just so fits with the with the approach of Mary's Center, I think we're going to see an enormous expansion in what we do in that area. Mm -hmm. I think those are two areas that are particularly pertinent to what we're doing. So I know we're meant to go to Q&A, but uh, I want okay. one final quick question with Maria. Um, Rodrigo mentioned this oasis in the desert that you have created, and I think we recognize that we need more oases and maybe even having your oasis create a rainforest <laughs> so that we're not just going from one oasis to another. No, my hair will go bad. <laughs> <laughs> we have hairspray in the oasis, in the rainforest. Um, but, you know, what are your thoughts about how to really change this bigger landscape? This isn't just about preserving and sustaining a, a small oasis, as wonderful as it has been. It is about truly being the cutting edge of a revolution and fundamental changes in how we deliver health and social welfare and protect young children and families in ways that optimize their their life course health development. I mean, what's your fantasy there? Well, I think uh, many, but I think I, I would say because of lack of time, I think um, sometimes it's not so much about the fact that there's not enough money to do all of this. It's about how we bring all those buckets of money together to talk to each other because at the end of the day, it really is about um, you know, that person who is on the bus who may have tuberculosis or on the metro is going to you know, inoculate all of us you know, that have the money and the means and the insurance. And so I think that um, I would just say one action is to, and I think, I think we're going to have to do it, and I think that the private sector, um, you know, when you have uh, CVS coming together with Aetna, coming together with a whole bunch of other people. I think we at this community health center level, where we are really providing the, 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 the sensitive services, the integrated services, the services that really reach um, those individuals that may cost us so much more at the end, we need, to, we need to get out of those four walls and demand that we are part of that table of that table of creating services. So demand that the CVSs and the Ednas work with us to make sure that, that we are incorporated into that process. Instead of saying, why are you in our business? Why are you in our territory? Why are you competing with us? Because they're gonna do it whether we like it or not. Um, I think that, that our individual donors um, who, who, who give to organizations like this, I think that the corporations like the Kaisers and all the folks that, that give, us, give us money to do this work um, should sit at this table with us, with those big corporations, and then present all of this to government. Government ultimately has the bigger, the bigger pot of money, right? Um, in the government, you know, the amazing people in government, but I think that with every administration, there's new people, new ideas, and everything gets kind of gets put to the sideway when there's such great models. <clears throat> and, you know, I, I'm here to sit here to tout Mary Center, but there's so many other organizations that are here with us today and, and throughout the country. So I think um, coming together, I think there's, this is a moment in time. I think when there's so much chaos in, in this country, um, when in the midst of chaos, the most amazing things have happened. And I think that this is the time to bring that to, together, all of us together. That is a wonderful note to end the formal part of our panel. Um, we're going to have Q&A, but um, really the questions can be for any of the prior panelists too. Um, many of them are sitting in the front row here, so, and we have Mike, so please feel free to ask any questions, either of those on the stage or any of the prior uh, presenters and observers. Thank you. My name is Desiree De La Torre with the Children's National Health System. Thank you to all of the speakers and to all the great work that Mary Center is doing. Um, my question for this panel, you talked about, and we've talked about all morning today, about the systems changes that you've de developed within Mary Center. Can you speak to some of the policy opportunities that we can move forward to move this work forward? 
Well, maybe I should, uh, I can respond to that. I think there are, there are a number uh, in this area. I think one I've already touched on, which is um, making payment systems and the scope of, the, of programs like Medicaid and Medicare much more flexible and much more open. And we've got a lot of progress in that area, in both of those programs, particularly in Medicaid over many years, and more recently in the Medicare Advantage program, which will allow senior services, uh, uh, money spent on, on the health of seniors, to be a lot more flexible, which would allow an organization like Mary Center to contemplate doing a lot more with elderly, more elderly uh, patients, which is something we're, we're thinking about. Uh, I think also, uh, in, in that regard, the whole sort of budgeting. One of the things that is really important is for different agencies, in, whether it be at the federal level, or the state level, or even the county and city level, to talk to each other. Uh, now, we are seeing, in some areas, uh, that happening. Um, the, half the states have what they call children's cabinets, which for children's services brings together people from the education departments, from transportation, and so on, to actually plan budgets together. Um, and, and that's very important in, uh, in, in this regard. So I think th those are two particular ones uh, that I think are very important. But I think, you know, coming from, uh, uh, from Children's National, um, uh, to be able to allow more effectively these tertiary institutions or major hospital systems and the clinics and what goes on in the communities to more seamlessly work together through data changes, through payment systems and so on, I think is the core of what has to happen. If we can do that, which I think we can, I don't think this is a partisan, it's not a partisan issue. Um, and it can go forward both in smaller steps by regulatory changes and just, just the way policymakers and people work together to statutory changes in some cases to allow something like the Medicaid program to do more in the housing area, for example. Um, so it requires all of these. Um, but that's, as I said, that's kind of my day job to kind of think about these. And uh, I'm very happy to share more with any of you that uh, wants to get in touch with me. Yes. Hi, this is uh, more of a comment. I'm Catalina from Clinica del Pueblo. I just want to say thank you. Um, I think that this kind of research helps all of us in the federally qualified health center world and that it's, uh, we know that we have great outcomes, but to be able to raise how we produce health, what are the things that we're doing that are getting us there and to raise those questions uh, and raise even more questions is really uh, advancing all of our work and thank you so much. Uh, Jennifer Brooks again, Project Evident. I just, in terms of the opportunities for those who aren't aware, there's a preschool development grant application that states are looking at right now that is birth of five. Um, and it's meant to be more comprehensive in its approaches. So I think if there are state level advocates who work on community health centers who want to get involved in that conversation before that application goes in, it's due November 5th. I just spent the last week with those folks, so. Yes. Uh, I just want to push back on something you said a little bit or get some comments. When you <laughs> talked about St. Mary's Center, which is uh, fantastic, uh, providing fantastic community-based care as an oasis in a desert. I think when it comes to health centers, it's more like an array of islands in a sea of bewilderment <laughs> <laughs> in, in that we, uh, in getting to some of Raphael's point, we have to have a knowledge infrastructure where we can learn from each other almost instantaneously. Mm -hmm. uh, because there's no reason, uh, there are m uh, different forms of Maria around the country, not as, maybe as talented as here, but that are perfectly willing, one know all about this and would suck it up in a minute, and there's things going on in other parts of the country that St. Mary's would learn about, and we're at a tremendous disadvantage by not having that infrastructure. Um, and uh, so we're not really a bunch of oases. We're really more of islands, but I think very rich islands, lush islands that have a lot going on that we need to connect with each other. Absolutely. That's a good point. I think we are exactly on time, which is a bit of a miracle, I have to I say. I say one last thing. Yes. Just because <laughs> 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 your comment actually made me think about it, and so did Rodrigo, which is that when I think about Desiree's question, so tying all, all of these points together, um, when we think about healthcare in this country, regardless of your party affiliation, um, we as a country have come a long way in the last couple of years around thinking about expecting healthcare, not just as a right, 
but as a way in which we take care of ourselves, our families, and our communities. And whatever your party affiliation, the demand uh, that is expected is to hold our officials accountable, whether elected or appointed. And the way in which we do that is one through the ballot box at every single level, whether it's for you know, the, the county medical officer or the sheriff or the school board member or the city council members, all the way up to the President of the United States. And I feel like at this moment in time, we have to be crystal clear about that call to action for democracy. Because when we can change Medicaid funding and can weave and braid funding in the way in which Stuart and Maria talked about and had that flexibility, that's as a result of the change in laws and a change in policies and procedures. And if you want those changes, not you just in this room, but all of us want those changes, we have to expect our leaders to perform and to demand that kind of justice so that getting health care is not something that takes uh, 15 steps, but in fact, it's something that we can see in our communities, not just at Mary Center, but across our country. And I think that that's really the hope I, I, I want to leave us with is about taking, taking that action and making sure that we do our due diligence and making sure we vote at every step, at every level of our country, because that's the kind of change we all deserve. Thank you. Thank you. And I just, yes! <laughs> Thank you, and I, I should leave it at that, but I just, I ask, I just... It's your show, Maria, it's your show. Your We're show. here for you. Oh, this is great, this is great. So, um, uh, Rafael, thank you so much for, for this. I, I think that one other thing that I just want to say that, go to your point, is that uh, at the center, we do use this data, right? So it's not data just to report to government. That's right. And to hold, to, to say to government, here's... It's here's more the you, compliance. Right, That's not right. the compliance piece. So, right. so it's more really about moving those ships, right? So we take that data and painstakingly, like, I know our providers will, will agree with this and, and all of our leaders that, it, you know, you take that data and it's like, oh my gosh, our, our you know, our outcomes are not as great as we thought it would be or you know, we didn't see as many patients, or we didn't br bring as many money, or all the, all the things that make an organization tick, but we use that data to really transform organizations and to transform um, how we develop our staff and where, w how much we do at Mary Center to make sure that we don't just grow, but that we also grow in our knowledge, and, and that's through the research and the evaluation that we do on a continuous basis. So I just wanted with that to say thank you so much to Alice, to Dr. Uh, Elliot, and his whole team um, for what, what you do every day, and, f and particularly to the committee. Um, we have not thanked today the committee that put all this together and that gave us your insight and your advocacy, and I see you in front right here, Michelle Tenenbaum, thank you so much for, for being, and others of you who are in that committee. So thank you, thank you so much. I was asked to make just a few final remarks, and given the time, I'll make them very brief. Uh, but I can't help uh, just saying how amused I was when I was listening to Rodrigo talking about his call from Maria. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, because I, when I first, my first encounter with uh, Mary Center was from Brookings doing some initial work, a report on, uh, uh, on Mary's Center. And then I thought, Maria would like to meet with you. Uh, <laughs> So I meet with Maria, and basically within five minutes, you have to be on the board. Uh, and then several months later, you need to be chair of the board. Uh, so I'm kind of waiting for my next assignment. Uh, and uh, for those of you, uh, if you get a call from Maria, be, be prepared. Uh, something is going to happen. Um, but I just want to uh, say specifically, uh, really from that, that we've all talked about Maria, uh, and it's really important to recognize that um, organizations like, like Mary's Center need a charismatic leader like Maria. But the important thing to understand is that organizations continue and expand over time and replicate when they don't just have a, a, a leader, but they put into place the systems and they analyze those systems to allow the organization to continue itself. Uh, uh, you look at organizations like Harlem Children's Zone, Jeff Kennedy, if you know about that. One of the things he did, as Maria is doing, is set in the systems and the ana internal analysis to understand what the success is and not to be dependent. And that's a really important feature of, of, of successful organizations. Uh, let me just end by saying that the, the, um, the report from uh, the Urban Institute, you've just heard the preliminary findings and analysis, will be ready uh, early next year. 
uh, and that will be available on uh, the, the website here at, Ur at Urban and also uh, at Mary's Center. Uh, this event has also been uh, recorded, so you'll be able to go back and look at it or tell your friends about it uh, to have a look at it later on. And you can see that on uh, Mary Center website at Mary Center, no apostrophe, Mary Center um, uh, dot uh, org. Uh, and all the event material will be uh, on that as well. Um, I also want to just finally thank everybody, thank all the people, the speakers and presenters and those of you in the audience. I want particularly to thank uh, the Urban Institute for not only doing the evaluation work, but making this, again, this uh, facility available uh, to us today. I want to thank all of you in the audience uh, generally, and, and uh, there's a lot of uh, excitement about what we're doing in this room, and tell all your friends about it. Uh, and uh, we really look forward to, after the, this first 30 years, to another more than 30 years, uh, and to others doing the same thing. And that's the key. If we can see other organizations around the country, and some of them are doing similar things, talking to each other, replicating building, we will fundamentally change the way in which healthcare and social services are provided uh, in this country to the benefit of everybody. So thank you very much indeed. <laughs>